Well, that's a slightly different picture in complexion to the one that first had some jaws dropping around here. I think the panel might agree uh, the perils of uh, peaking too early on some of these <laughs> yes, numbers. That's right. uh, Vicky Dunn, yeah, there's clearly going to be, you know, an improvement, I suppose, for your party in Yerriby, but an open question on whether you can turn the tables on that third seat yes, vis a vis I, I, Labor. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. And, um, uh, the we are doing better, and I think that Rachel is right that the that last time it was the tram and Megan, because mm. Megan Fitzharris was had sort of bankable niceness, which is something that you <laughs> you know you can't you you know it's so powerful mm. in an election campaign, mm. and I I don't think that the Labor ticket shines in the way that it did. The last time, and I, I think that we had the same problem last time. We had mm -hmm. a couple of strong candidates, and then some people who didn't didn't sort of really cut through. And I think that this time our candidates are more inclined to have cut through mm -hmm. in in Yerriby, and I think that that shows. Thoughts, Rachel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I, I think this is a really interesting... Um, I, I feel... I really feel for Deepak, if Anthony's right, that um, it's Deepak who may lose the seat. I think it is probably... It's too early to say. Things move around a lot in Hare Clark as those preferences are distributed. It's, it's um, but they in the count long enough. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, but there's also a question, I think, that will come into potentially come into play here of whether there's a gender vote as well. So mm. whether um, if Georgia gets knocked out, her votes are more likely to go to Suzanne because it's a female vote or whether it's something different happening there. So I think there's so many different factors that can come into play in the distribution of preferences in Hare Clark that it's actually really hard to mm. say that those two are far enough apart now to, to, to make a clear distinction. Mm. But if either of them loses their seat, you know, that... that you know, that, that will be really sad for us because they're both excellent members and they've both worked really hard for their community. An emerging story in Murrumbidgee, and it was good that Anthony picked up on Julia Jones because you're talking about a MLA who's got a significant profile and responsibility in her shadow portfolios mm. as shadow police minister. In the campaign, she was shadow health spokesperson alongside Vicky Dunn, who for a long time was health, health spokesperson mm. with 62% of the vote now coming in she's still languishing in what is it, seventh position at this point. And I guess, Vicky Dunn, I'm interested to know, do you think her lack of fronting the health policies you had, you were a key part of announcing those policies and speaking on behalf of the party, has that hurt her name recognition for the undecideds in Murrumbidgee, where they might not have known she would have that prominent position and thus were less, in less inclined to vote for her? I'm actually very surprised at, th at this because Jeremy Hanson and Julia Jones had a sort of uh, a lockstep campaign. As mm. the incumbents, they were they were out campaigning together uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and and really, I think, from, from my point of view, worked very hard at not cutting each other's grass. Um, and it is very interesting that there is such a disparity in, <coughs> in, the, in the vote. And I, mm. you know, Julia's a very hard working, uh, member and a very hard-working yeah. campaigner. Mm -hmm. And had quite yeah. a prominence in critiquing, criticising some Labor policies and yeah. also offering alternatives from the Liberals. So yeah. this appears to be a standout on the negative side for your side of politics, mm -hmm. that she is struggling at this point yeah. and will struggle to retain her seat. Anecdotally, um, yeah. if I might just bump bit, anecdotally we had heard that um, obviously Jeremy and Julia are, were working very closely together, um, but there, there was some you know, indication that they were encouraging people to vote one for Jeremy, two for Julia. If Jeremy doesn't get over a quota, mm. that really hurts. That's, yeah, so, that's right. And he's um, down 5.5% yeah. on his yes, previous yeah. vote as yeah. leader, to acknowledge and, and that. You, and you've got to say that there is usually a, a leader's premium of probably something like yeah. 4%, you know, that... that and mm. I think Murrumbidgee is very trouble, troubling for us mm. because we had very high expectations with... Um, you know, the growth in the Malonglo Valley, yep. uh, Coombs and Wright and... The Benham heart of transport prospect, issues as well, as and, a redistribution, Vicky And they Dunn. worked really... And then mm. taking in Yarralumla and Deakin into that, we were we were feeling that that made life easy, easier yeah. for us. Um, but, but um, you know, it's... Also, I think you have to acknowledge the very fine campaign that Fiona Carrick has run um, and to be... <clears throat> 
you know, in, a, in the ungrouped column and to achieve that sort of mm. vote is, is very, very impressive. Being it's president the of the Woden Community Council for several years clearly has had some cut through with people in the region who are concerned mm. about elements of Labor's record down there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and I think that there is, for, for people who, who would be Labor voters and who can't bring themselves to vote Liberal, Fiona is a, is a very good alternative for them. And, and, and you also have to look at... I think that there really is uh, a women's vote and it's probably one of the reasons that Leanne Castle is doing so well because she's the only woman on the Liberal ticket in, in Yarrabee. Um, and she sort of said to me, you know, you know, how do I stand out? And I said, you're the girl, <laughs> the only girl. On and, and the thing is that when I was first elected, I don't think there was a women's vote um, for amongst the Liberals, there certainly yep. is now. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that uh, when Sarah Sween goes out, those votes will go to Julia mm. um, and because Sarah's sort of down the bottom. So when you see the distribution of preferences yeah. yep. and also you would see perhaps see votes going to Julia from Fiona Carrick mm. as well. Yeah. But it's not yeah. all linear, is it? I mean, there's there are other female candidates like Beck Cody on the Labor mm. side that are uh, in a... <clears throat> difficult position, I think we can say there in Murrumbidgee, mm. but we can pull that apart a little later because you're watching ACT Votes 2020 and our Chief Election Analyst from the ABC, Anthony Green, is going to do a stock take for us on where we're at with an overall summary um, standing by his screen as we reach a point in the evening where, in fact, the votes counted have tipped over half now. I think, Anthony, we're seeing figures of about 56% on your dashboard yep. here, so that sets the scene for an overview from you. OK, I've just <clears throat> spent the five, last five minutes going to, through five A3 size spreadsheets of preferences. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try and summarise five A3 sheets. As only you so can. can. <laughs> no, I'll do Brinda Bella laugh because it's it's um, we've got a live cross coming up there. But in Yerribee, if I just look at the candidates that are elected, we're saying that the preference distribution, elects Alistair Coe, Michael Pedersen, Leanne Castley defeats James Milligan, Suzanne Orr gets elected, and Andrew Braddock wins the last seat mm -hmm. uh, on the preference distribution. Uh, that's Sorry, how, what we... Anthony, how big is the, how big is the vote? That uh, it's on the 44. 44, mm -hmm. yeah. So... Uh, of course, you get small cutoffs. I haven't had a chance to look at them really finely, mm -hmm. but that's what the current one is producing. If you look at uh, look at what's next, Murrumbidgee, at the moment on the leaders, it's saying Jeremy Hansen is elected. Uh, I missed I, I, I missed who the second Liberal elected, but Chris Steele, Marisa Patterson, pa Patterson, and Emma Davidson would win the seat at the moment on the current distribution of preferences. Uh, Karajong is a real boil over because on the current distribution, um, only Elizabeth Lee gets elected as a Liberal and you get two Greens, Andrew Barr and Rachel Stephen-Smith. Now, I find God, that I a thought bit... you were about to say it was a real boil over because I lost my <laughs> no, seat. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, because from the party totals, well, they're going to go 1.4, 1.6. There are obviously preferences which are helping the Greens and there are mm -hmm. two Greens mm -hmm. in at the same time which wow. helps the count. But at the moment, that's what it produces. But as I said, there's a lot more counting to come. Uh, and uh, Jin and Dera, at the moment, I'm again, let's just look at the party totals here because the Liberal vote's a bit low and the Greens are on 0.78. At the moment, the distribution of preferences elects three Labor members, Yvette Berry, Tara Shane, Gordon Ramsay, Elizabeth Kickett gets elected and Joe Clay, the Green. So at the moment, that adds up to, uh, let me see, eight, 11 Labor five green, six green, and uh, eight liberals. That's, I, I, I think those numbers are a bit skewed. Yeah. But that's what the preference distribution is producing. So um, the electronic voting has given us a result which I think we might have to wait for the manual paper votes to be counted. And the last seat, which I didn't do then, was Brinda Bella, of course. Uh, and as we've got across, I'll say what the party tells us. Labor's on 2.47, liberals on 2.31, the greens on 0.63, and it comes out uh, in terms of who's elected. Troy Birch, Mick Gentleman, and Tamus Worm and Gibbings from the Labor ticket and Mark Parton and Nicole Lauder from the Liberal ticket. So it's a Labor gain from the Liberals in Brindabella. Yeah, there's a bit to get through there, which we will, but because Anthony has steered us in the direction of Brindabella, Nicole Lauder is standing by to speak to us from there. And, Nicole, it looks like you're back, whether you're prepared to accept that or not is up to you, but in difficult 
circumstances, to say the least, for your party. Can I get you to put some explanation around what's gone on in the entire Brindabella electorate? Look, it's been a difficult campaign for everyone. We've had the pandemic, of course, this year, which has given the Chief Minister and the Health Minister, so the Labor Ministers, every opportunity to be on TV every night. So it's been really difficult for the opposition to gain traction, as well as many other issues earlier in the year, the smoke, the bushfires, the house storm. It was just such a strange year for everyone. And it curtailed our, I guess, traditional campaigning. There's still a long way to go, I think. I, I refer to my previous campaigns where it took quite some time before I was elected, so I guess I'm not in that state right now where I'd say, oh, you know, I'm celebrating being elected. I would like to wait and make sure everything falls into place through the preference process. Nicole Order, a lot's been spoken about, and you've mentioned it again, incumbency through times of crisis. But it, from your perspective in Brindabella, what positive or negative impact has the campaign style led by Alistair Coe had on the way voters have so far been found to put their vote? Well, it's an interesting question and obviously something is going to have weeks if not months of review and soul searching after the election for all parties involved. You know, I feel from my perspective, this is my third campaign, mm. I felt it was the best organised and best run campaign I've been involved in. And, you know, while at the moment it looks like I may be elected, I think, you know, there's some reasons why that may be the case for me personally. Potentially maybe a little bit of a bump from being deputy leader, even though I'm sort of a bit media shy, I haven't focused a lot on increasing that profile. I think um, being one of the more high-profile women, if you like, on our ticket, I think I hope, would like to hope that the work I've done in the past few years has stood me in good stead and certainly the really hard work of my team who've been absolutely tireless in their efforts. So if I get elected, I think those are some of the reasons why that would be the case. Your campaign, that of many candidates of the Liberals, was disciplined and it was focused. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But was there enough of the how and why, as opposed to just the what, given the ACT electorate, whether there's a chippy, a tradie, a PhD candidate or a university lecturer, always asks why, not just what? Well, look, I think there was. I didn't find an issue with the way that the campaign was run. Um, you know, I, I thought the best thing was to stick with the campaign messaging and be absolutely disciplined and on message. And at this point, hopefully for me, it looks like that that's the, the benefit. Nicole Lauder, it's going to be an interesting night to come and obviously there's been some results that have raised some eyebrows. As to how it settles, we'll find out in due course. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. And you're watching ACT Votes 2020, where the time in Canberra has just gone a quarter to eight and the total number of votes counted climbing well above half of the uh, votes in the barrel. And all of this, for the numerically minded, is to elect 25 MLAs to the ACT Legislative Assembly for the next five years. That's the backdrop, but consider this. In adding up to 25 seats, Anthony Green, the ABC's chief election analyst, has given us the word boil over in connection with one seat, and then he suggested to us ALP 11, Libs 8, Greens 6. That, Shane Rattenbury, Greens <laughs> leader, would be a most unusual, oh, here's a common word for 2020, unprecedented <laughs> legislative <laughs> assembly for the ACT with you and five others. Look, it actually reflects the federal election result we got last year. I've said many times through the course of this campaign that if we got exactly the same vote we got in the federal election, we would win six seats. I didn't expect it to happen. We always seen a poll a bit lower in the ACT election, but we started our field campaign right back at the start of the year. Uh, we've put forward a really detailed vision. Uh, this would defy the historical trend in a sense, in the, as I spoke of earlier, the smaller parties tend to struggle when there's been a two-party government. Uh, it's, a, I think, a testament to the vision we've put forward and the hard work of our candidates. Just before Adam, I know he's going to want to ask you some questions, but I'm going to get ahead of myself here and say it's Monday. 
and these numbers are pretty firm, you have to sit down with Andrew Barr and negotiate the next agreement. Mm. Priorities. You've got significant negotiating power, to say the least, <laughs> with these numbers. Look, it's, it is very straightforward. We've put out all our policies out there in the election. We always say that's what it's about for us. It's one of the reasons we said early in the campaign we would not be able to support the Liberal Party to form government if we were in that balance of power situation because there was a real difference in our policies. For us, we've particularly highlighted the need to build more social and affordable housing in this election, uh, particularly with the failure of the federal budget to deal with that last week. And so many economists, so many community <coughs> sector people saying, this is one of the best things you can do to stimulate the economy and deliver that social dividend, yeah. that will be high on our list. And structurally, I imagine you'd be looking at at least two ministers, maybe three. Well, that's a question we will need to consult with the party on. You know, and this always surprises people on election night. We won't make any decisions until we've met with our party membership. We've got a meeting booked for the middle of this week. We'll talk to them about the details and see what they think we should okay, do. OK, hold that thought. Shane sure. Rattenbury and my ABC colleague, Adam Shirley, because we've reached a very important moment in the evening where there is breaking news ready to be announced and the ABC's chief election analyst, Anthony Green, is standing by to do that. Well, I think, look... We're looking at the Chamber uh, as, as to what the overall position is at the moment. At the moment, uh, we have a definite 10 Labor, one Green, eight Liberal. Uh, we can push that in terms of seats we think are likely, and that gets up to Labor 11 and Greens 2, and that's 13, and that's the majority, and uh, everyone wants to be to say, we're predicting a majority government. And I, look, I think that's the likely outcome, but that's based on a bunch of preference distributions. I can't see, the Liberals are ahead in vote in Yerriby, uh, and that's the only seat they have a chance of getting three. So, to me, they can, they can only just reach 11. The Labor Party has two definite in every state, every seat, and I think that and they have got a third in Brindabella and there's still a chance for a third in Ginandera. So, I think the Labor Party's... I'm confident they have 11. Uh, and the Greens, I'm pretty... They have a definite one in Karajong. I think uh, they're highly likely to get one in Murrumbidgee. And on the preference distributions we've got so far, they have a potential to get another two or three seats as well. So at the moment, I, I'm pretty confident the Labor Party and the Greens are back in government, yeah. but the final numbers are a bit hard to work out. Yes, and th those final numbers, Anthony, are obviously significant if the final number for the AOP happens to be 13, not 12. Significant when it comes to the Greens, Look, right? I mean, I am making the predictions that the Liberals will not form government. I can quite happily say that. Uh, and um, therefore, if the Liberals can't form government, the Labor will form government. I'm sorry, I've been going through this, <laughs> call the election, let's do this thing, and I've been going through this logic of trying to say this. The Labor Party and the Greens, I believe, have won the election. It's just rather difficult to be certain of the numbers. But I cannot see how the Liberals get more than 11 seats on the numbers we have at the moment. The only way that can change is if the paper votes are very different mm. from, the, from the electronics. No. Uh, given the paper votes are only about 60,000 of the 300,000 votes. I can't see how the paper votes could have that much impact. Yep, that's understood and it's appreciated. Anthony, he's trying to bring clarity, which is his job, to uncertain situations with vast amounts of votes still to land. But you can see the point he's trying to make, that there is not a pathway on these numbers for Alistair Coe and his band of MLAs to form government to reach 13 or anything approaching that when you added them all together. So, Adam Shirley, mm. uh, we have something approaching similar, but there's subtle variations still to happen that entail Shane here and the Greens. Mm. Gin and Dara is a really good example, I think, to look at to the really good points that Anthony was making about that final composition of how the Assembly will look because there are there is a strong showing for the ALP. Well, there's, they're basically sitting on what they were last election, but that Belco party factor, mm. which we've spoken about, has split the vote effectively. It's pulled votes away from both Peter Kane and, and Robert Gunning, by the looks of it. They are sitting just behind Joe Clay. And I made an analogy to, to a couple of colleagues recently that what could happen in Ginandera is that the Belco party and the lower Liberal candidates couldn't, could end up crashing speed skating style and someone could do a Bradbury through the middle. 
it might seem uh, a bit uncharitable, but Joe, Cl Joe Clay could be that person. Perhaps Robert Gunning or, P or uh, Mr Kane, Peter Kane, could get there as well. But it certainly has made the Liberals' job harder, I think, Vicky yep. Dunn, in Ginandera with Bill Stefaniak and his ticket running. Oh, it, undoubtedly, uh, it was no help to the, to the Liberal Party to have Bill run. Um, you know, he... he had this sort of quixotic, you know, keep the bastards honest thing, but it was quite clear that he was going to take votes from us. Is your party upset that he ran? Um, Given I'm he's a senior that, Liberal I, Party. I am, I am upset that he ran, um, and I, I haven't really discussed this. I, I honestly don't think it was helpful mm -hmm. uh, because we, as I, as I said at the start, we have a very narrow path to, to winning, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think on the basis of the 60% the figures I have to agree with Anthony, um, you know, as reluctant as I am, I have to agree with Anthony and... Would it be too strong to suggest it was selfish of Bill Stefania? Uh, it was... I think it was misguided. I think it was, I think it was misguided because he... You know, and you can see from the, the, the Ginandera vote, he, he, he carved out, you know, four or five per cent of our vote. Mm. And it makes it hard for that second person to get through. I'm, I'm moderately comfortable because the that those votes will come back mm. into the liberal, into the liberal column, mm. and and therefore I'm I, I I don't think that we're in a situation where we're going to lose a seat in Gin and Dera, um, but he he didn't make it easy. I mean, Elizabeth Kickett was a first time member; she was a sitting member, um, and carried that ticket by herself, and she wasn't helped by Bill Stefaniak and but, and Chick Henry. But in any event, uh, on the numbers that Anthony's painting out here, that one seat and Bill Stefaniak's role played in it yeah. is not the difference between oh, no, government... no, 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 I'm just talking yeah. about in Gin and Dera. Yeah. It didn't make our life no, no. any easier. Yeah. I'll get some thoughts from Rachel in a moment as what looks to be a member of a returning government, but Shane Rattenbury, you want to make a point? I was just going to observe that... I take Vicky's point about the preferences flying back, but we should look at the fact the Belco party is running five candidates. Mm. Mm. And there could be significant could exhaustion, exhaustion of preferences yes. out yep. of that. We yep. saw that in the 20, 2008 election where the Motorist Party ran, which featured Chick Henry, of course, as well. <laughs> they ran five candidates in all the electorates and so many of their votes died. It actually led to Caroline Lacuda winning the second seat mm. in what was the old central seat of Molongal mm. at that time. So I think that is a risk for yes. the Liberal Party yep. Yep. that the Belco party might do the same thing this time. But also... It means that the last person elected is probably going to be elected without a quota. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, and just because we haven't had any response from you, Rachel Stephen Smith, to Anthony's prediction, qualified though it is, yeah. uh, you must feel confident, as Vicky is, uh, that these are the likely numbers to settle, and therefore you're back in a significant role in a bar-led government. Well, I, that, I hope so. I hope that's right. And, and yes, I think, that's, I think it's true that Liberals will not be able to form government on these numbers. Um, and we will wait with bated breath to see what happens in those last seats and, mm. and how many seats the Greens um, do end up holding. We know that it takes time to count those fifth seats. Even with all of this electronic voting, you know, there are still paper votes to count. Um, we're not, I think, you know, I think we just do need to be a little bit cautious about calling those sure. seats too early. Uh, Greens, you mentioned, uh, enhanced at least to mm. two MLAs mm. and I'm going to go and suggest more confident, possibly even bolshy because of that. Can you live with them? Can you work with them? Uh, we have lived with them and worked with them for many years now and I think Sometimes we, we always... <laughs> um, Andrew Barr always said throughout this campaign that the likelihood of a majority government for Labor was, you know, almost nil, that if we were returned to government it would be almost certainly with the support of the Greens. Now, obviously, uh, we've had the support of two... Greens uh, and 12 Labor members to date. Uh, if it's more, we will work with that. If it's two, again, we will work with that. Yeah. Um, that's what we have to do. Um, yeah. And we've, you know, Shane is actually, Shane is an excellent colleague. Um, and I think Carolyn Lacuda was an excellent member of the Assembly who really stood up for her constituents and what she believed in, in green values. Uh, and, you know, this is, if this is what the ACT people have chosen to deliver to the, elective, uh, to the Legislative Assembly, uh, that's what we'll work with. One big, progressive, happy family, <laughs> it seems, Labor and the Greens, because Saturday night turns to Sunday and Sunday <laughs> turns to Monday, which is when significant players in both parties have to get down and design 
the uh, features of the next government, one of the key players involved in those sort of discussions is Yvette Berry, Deputy Labor Leader, who's joining us from the Labor Club in Belconnen, just happens to be within her own electorate as well. I'll say congratulations, Yvette Bar Berry, you're back. And uh, there were a few nervous moments on the way through, I'm going to suggest to you this evening, even for yourself. There yeah, look, there always is with hair, Clark, and you just have to wait it out and, and wait till the end and, and find out all the preference flows. It's always a very complex, pro complex process. Uh, and uh, I think um, this time around, of course, the uh, results are coming out much sooner than, you know, waiting for a week and finding out. Uh, so that's always um, a, a really you know, long and drawn out process, but having the technology that we've had now uh, and being able to find out sooner rather than later about where things are falling, um, that does provide some certainty. And given some of the critique of it, Barry, around your management of schools, around issues of, of Labor's public transport problems as well as health, are you surprised, in addition to Gin and Derry, to that, well, 8% towards the Belco party, that you've still had a strong showing, not only in Gin and Derry, but it appears across the ACT? Look, do you know, every school system across the country uh, had really found uh, working through the international health pandemic really challenging. But in the ACT, I always had the backs of the teaching profession and all of our school staff to make sure that they were safe and being able to provide our young people with the best possible education during um, remote education. It was difficult for everyone. It was never going to be a smooth ride and we are still in the middle of an international health pandemic right now. Um, uh, so I've, uh, you know, always done that, always provided as much as I could reassurance for the community that we were doing as much as we can uh, to support young people, but particularly our teachers to make sure that they could continue that excellent education. And that's the message that I've been continuing to get out with the community. Uh, and the conversations that I've had with people in my own community, they've um, been very supportive <coughs> and I'm uh, absolutely grateful that they're continuing to support me. Uh, Tara Shane, who's currently running second behind you on the ticket on two-thirds of the votes counted, has had a 4.5% swing towards her. Is it time that she got elevated to the ministry? Well, you know, these are decisions for government uh, when the results are, are, are known. Um, but Tara has done an excellent job, of course, as a backbencher in the ACT Labor, Labor government. Backbencher's role is um, really that role of getting out and, and spreading the Labor message amongst the community. And Tara has done that diligently. And she's been um, a, a really great colleague in the Assembly. She's done amazing work as part of the ACT Labor's, Labor team and uh, really drawn some really strong support from um, the, the uh, Ginandera electorate. And, um, yeah, I've been happy to work with her over the last four years. Let's presume for now, because the numbers are going this way, that you'll form a minority or even majority government for the next four years. What is the first thing that you'll rectify about your management of your portfolios that you've come in for criticism for? Uh, well, I'll continue to do what I've been doing over the last four years, which is making sure that our school systems are as equitable as possible, making sure that people in housing are supported to maintain their tenancies, and supporting people on low income so that they actually get a decent crack at happiness. Mm. That's what I've been focused on. That's the Labor thing to do. And that's been through the leadership of Andrew Barr, allowing all of his ministers, but including me, to be able to do the things that actually matter to people's mm. lives. Um, so uh, having Andrew Barr as Chief Minister has been um, really great for every single minister in the government to be able to do that work. Uh, you mentioned housing on social housing and another than former leader John Stanhope, the longest serving Chief Minister in the ACT, has been highly critical of your side of politics on your social housing policy at times. It's also been a sticking point for your coalition partners, the Greens. Are you going to relook at how your salt and pepper approach across the ACT for social housing works and might you rectify that? Look, all of the experts tell me and all of the uh, social housing providers in the ACT, all of the um, people who provide housing and supports in housing across the city, but also when you talk about countries that provide this, like Finland and Scandinavian countries, salt and peppering of public housing works for everyone, not just people who live in um, public housing. They have the same rights of being able to have you know, goals and aspirations, just like the rest of us, to live where they choose that best suits their needs. And that's what we'll continue to do. And I know that's what Canberrans want. 
generally Canberrans are an inclusive community and I know that this is what they want for people in our community as well. In conclusion for now, Vet Berry, given the way the numbers are falling, how sure are you that Labor will continue to run the ACT either in minority or majority? At the moment, it's looking really positive and we're very excited to see the numbers as they are, of course. Uh, again, with Hair Clark, you just have to wait it out to the end. All those preference flows can make a significant difference. We just wait till, the, till all the final votes are counted before you can absolutely call it. Yvette Berry, appreciate your time tonight. It's still quite a diverse range of results that we're seeing come in and we will see how it lands in the end. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adam. Now at 8.02 Canberra time on ACT Votes 2020, we know that we have the return of a bar Labor government uh, adding to what will become 23 unbroken years for successive Labor governments. That's six terms in the Legislative Assembly of the ACT. Now, in all likelihood, this will once again be a minority Labor government supported by the Greens. Mm. Question, could this happen anywhere else in our region? Well, an interesting contest has been playing out in New Zealand this evening as well. And Anthony Green, our chief election analyst, has been keeping an eye on that with his all black button. And do we see parallel currents, Anthony, hmm. between ACT and NZ tonight? Well, I know there used to be an international flight between Canberra and Wellington, but That's I, really gone. I, don't, That's I don't see there's a lot of connection between the two, to be honest. Um, the, the Labor Party is still on track for majority government. Uh, their votes slipped below 50 at 49.1, but um, you don't, it, parties that don't reach 5%, they get excluded from the calculation, which is why New Zealand First and Winston Peters uh, have got no seats. There's one other seat here, which is the Maori Party, who uh, looks like at the moment they might win one of the Maori seats in which case they get that seat and it comes off the totals of the other parties. If you get, if you get under 5% but you win a seat, you still keep that seat. So at the moment, Labor is still on track for a majority on the right, on right with 64, Nationals 35, Act uh, 10 seats, the Greens 10 seats. So that's the position in New Zealand at the moment. The uh, Ardern government is back in office almost certainly as a majority government. OK, and we are hearing that Judith Collins has conceded just in the last few minutes. That's the Nationals' leader. So you can see where the evening is going to head in New Zealand as uh, surely Jacinda Ardern will be stepping up to proclaim victory. Mm -hmm. But, Shane Rattenbury, on my point uh, to Anthony, I'll come back to Anthony in just a moment, you, for one, leave aside the question of minority-majority, but you, for one do see parallels between the proportional representation mm. system that applies here and the Greens labour axis uh, and that which kind of exists in New Zealand. Yes, you do tend to see that in proportional representation yes. systems. The electorate is more accurately reflected in the vote, uh, in the, sorry, in the makeup of the parliament where it's not sort of the winner takes all, which you tend to get in the single member electorates. You actually see the community's will being more accurately reflected in the makeup of the parliament. The New Zealand parliament does that. Our Senate, of course, tends to do that, and it's much more like the European parliaments, mm. as we have with the hair clerk <laughs> systems here in both the ACT and Tasmania. Yep, and uh, I suppose Rachel Stephen-Smith, um, on the sort of mm. outline that Anthony's painted for us, uh, what do you see as the, the most pressing priorities when you do get back down to work as an incumbent government being returned well, earlier this week? We've been really clear that the recovery from COVID and jobs uh, has to be the number one focus. Obviously, we need to continue to manage what is an ongoing global pandemic and uh, the ACT is not a bubble. We are not immune from potentially having new cases of COVID or an outbreak here. Uh, Australia has managed really, really well. New South Wales has managed really, really well. And obviously, the situation in Victoria is now um, getting well under control. What is it you're actually managing, though, when, when the numbers are at zero? Um, do you keep it suppressed, for mm. sure? But mm. there, there must be 
rebuilding phases that present themselves as priorities now. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. So the recovery, we've still got you know thousands of jobs that have been lost in our community. Mm. We've still got I industry sectors mm. that are not going to recover in the next six months or the next 12 months. So how do we ensure that we're creating jobs both in the public and private sector? And I think one of the things that has led to this positive result, although recognising that you know the Greens result seems to have been really outstanding as well, but Andrew Barr, I think, is trusted by people to continue to create jobs. We went into this pandemic with an unemployment rate of 2.9%. Uh, people know that there is a safe pair of hands here to manage the recovery from COVID, both in, in the economy and in the community. Uh, Adam, chime in if you if you want to. I do just want to ask a question because embedded in the ACT system is succession planning and transition. Andrew Barr, remarkably successful tonight, as four years ago, going to be in his sixth year. At what point do people naturally transfer out in this system as leader so as to prolong the prospects of the party? Well, Andrew's been really clear that he put himself forward for four years and if he was elected, he would be there for four years. And so um, that's what he has said and that's what I think we need to trust in him, that that's what he means. Um, he has obviously put some caveats around that in terms of any personal circumstances that might arise during the four years. Um, but he has put himself forward for four years and he's been really clear that he's going to stay. Briefly, it's a good question, Greg, because prior to Megan Fitzharris leaving politics, and it was only a couple of years ago, uh, Megan Fitzharris, and I think I'm right in saying this, Rachel Stephen Smith, was seen as the anointed one to carry the torch of leadership. At that point, things changed, and Andrew Barr said to me in an interview, as much as my plans had to change as well. Is it, in fact, possible, as Greg was asking, that Andrew Barr will decide halfway through a term of a Labor government enough is enough because he's always said he will not be the treasurer and the chief minister forever. In fact, in even four, four years, five years from now. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think he's going to be the treasurer for the next four years. I think he's been really, really clear yep. that that portfolio will go to someone else and don't know who that person is going to be. Putting your hand up? Um, uh, I, he, he, we have also had a conversation about how uh, awkward it can be for the health minister to also be the treasurer. So I'm assuming that I will keep the health portfolio uh, if I am on the distribution of preferences re-elected. Um, so that is a decision for Andrew and Yvette, a conversation for Andrew and Yvette to have and for others to have around um, who's going to do what. Uh, but I'm just looking forward to um, getting back to work with Andrew Barr as the chief minister. I think this result tonight... On the, on the numbers that we've got so far, and I don't want to preempt um, the outcome, uh, but really is a vote of confidence in Andrew Barr as our Chief Minister. All right. Well, somehow I suspect that Adam Shirley, presenter of ABC Radio Canberra Mornings Program, will be asking that and similar questions about ministries and longevity of leaders uh, come, let's say, Monday <laughs> onwards. Um, we do want to check back in with mm. Anthony Green, though, to uh, update us on some individual electorate figures. I think you want to start with Gin and Dera. Yeah, it, it's very. It's got a similar issue to what's got for the Liberal Party to what's going on in Carajong. Um, Labor's got 2.44 quotas. The Liberals 1.56. The Greens 0.76. The Belcol 0.56. Now the problem for the Liberal Party is its highest polling candidate has only got 0.54, and the next 1.32. If you're going to have 1.56 of quota, you need one of your candidates to be on about 0.8. You need to be able to fill that first quota mm. and then have a left over. And at the moment, the first, the one candidate is there isn't high enough and the second candidate's getting knocked out too early. And on the current distribution of preferences, the Liberals' second candidate gets knocked out. They're just not high enough in the count individually. And also, the Belco Party's preference is about a, a huge slice of them exhaust mm. rather because there's mm. sort of five candidates people mm. have gone one to five mm. they don't flow to the liberal party which doesn't help the labor party has got 0 0.96 0 0.69 for tara shane 0 0.96 for vet berry gordon ramsay 0 0.52 and then there's other votes there they're coalescing to get three seats and gordon ramsay at the moment is the last candidate elected and joe clay's elected there's enough preferences coming up through the green ticket and then a few leakages to get the, Lib the greens to the last seat now that might not play out the same way. But at the moment, the problem the Liberal Party are having is that their, their lead candidate is very low and that's making it hard for them to fill the second seat when they're well short of two quotas. Mm -hmm. And something similar is going on in Currajong. 
Um, if you look at the party totals in Carajong, Labor's on 2.31, the Liberals on 1.57 and the Greens on 1.45. Now, some other parties here, like the Canberra Progressives, have got 0.3 of a quota, 5% of the vote. If you look at the leaders, Andrew Barr is elected on the preference distribution by Rachel Stephen Smith, who we know, at least know she gets elected on the surplus. So Rachel Stephen, mm -hmm. Stephen Smith is the second elected Labor candidate. Shane Rattenbury is on 0.8 and stays in the count for a long time, as does Rebecca Vassarotti on 0.39. They get quite a strong flow of preferences when the last Cambridge Progressive candidate gets elect, excluded, mm -hmm. which helps. But again, the lead Liberal candidate's only got 0.56 and there's a bit of leakage out of the ticket. And so the second Liberal gets excluded before the end of the count. And so that's, that's their problem. If, if one of their lead, if their lead candidate was more toward 0 0.7, 0 0.8, it might be a bit easier for the second candidate. But we're in a better position there, Anthony, because <clears throat> both the, the lead candidates are close together, whereas in Ginandera, Elizabeth, is, there's a yeah. big gap. So mm -hmm. I, I think that, that these, Elizabeth and Candace, are safer than the second yeah. Liberal in Ginandera. But I'd it's agree. still, it's still it, troubling. There's not, there's not many people there who are going to have preferences mm -hmm. towards the Liberals rather yeah. than mm -hmm. the Greens, and the Greens start at 1.45. Yeah, that's and right. Now, that's their problem now. That's 58%. It is, a, and of course, there are Labor preferences which help the Greens as well. Yep. There's a 2.3 quarter. Once Rachel Stephen Smith is elected, the third. Just keep place. repeating that, Anthony. I, I like <laughs> she that. She likes to say that. Uh, uh, then Maddie Norton goes up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Anthony, could you also take us to Murrumbidgee? We have Jeremy Hanson yes. standing by, so we might check in on Murrumbidgee first on the way to Jeremy Hanson. Party totals there are 2.2 for the Labor Party, 2.09 for the Liberals and 0.73 for the Greens. Again, the independents there are on 0.46. If you look at the candidates that are leading, Jeremy Hansen is re-elected on 0.88. His vote's not as high as last time. He doesn't have the leadership in his favour this time. Plus, last time, only Jeremy Hansen and Julia Johns were the only sitting members in that seat. This time, there's, there's, there's two Labor sitting members as well. And of those, Chris Steele is re-elected. Now, at the moment... Beck Cody is defeated by Marisa Patterson. This is always a peculiarity of Hair Clark that the electors, electors might vote somebody else in instead of you. And at this stage, it looks like Beck Cody might is losing to Marisa Patterson at the moment. She's the second elected Labor member. And after that, Emma Davidson on 0.43 is, uh, as I said, the green total is overall 0.73 quotas. The Independent, despite polling well, uh, let me see, Fiona Carrick, it's got 0.42 of a quarter. She can't get elected from there, it's too low. Uh, and with the Green vote coalescing up to Emma Davidson at the moment, that's turning into two Labor, two Liberal, one Green, without much doubt. OK, Anthony, thank you so much. Word has reached us that Andrew Barr, the Chief Minister, is making his way towards the venue that is the Labor Club in Belconnen, uh, from which he would make a speech later this evening. Uh, regular viewers of election nights know the convention tends not to be that the victor would go first. So he's at least moving to that location and that starts to put us in a zone where speeches can be expected at some time. All of that uh, prelude to introducing Jeremy Hansen. The Liberal leader four years ago uh, stood on that stage and had to concede. He's back in the Assembly again in the seat of Murrumbidgee as Anthony Green just explained. Jeremy Hansen, we're at that time of night for Liberals where the difficult questions may now come. Here's one for you. What went so wrong with this campaign? Yeah, look, I think it was actually a very strong campaign and, uh, you know, we had a great team, a wonderful bunch of uh, candidates. I think our message was very positive about change and about the future. But these are difficult times, uh, you know, with the bushfires and then COVID. And uh, what was a very negative campaign run by the Labor Party, uh, obviously that thrown up its challenges. But, you know, there's a lot of votes to be counted and there are preferences to be distributed. Uh, so, you know, it's not over till it's over. Uh, but obviously it look, does look challenging. You've led the Liberal Party before, Mr Hanson. You've come close but lost an election before. Would you have run the same campaign style and substance as what your leader, Alistair Coe, did? Look, I, I think it was a good campaign. I think that, you know, we presented uh, a positive plan for the future about uh, the better services that are needed in this town. We've seen a lot of neglect over the last 19 years. And across the board, be it in health or education or the cost of living, uh, Canberrans aren't happy with what's happening. Uh, so I accept that 
Uh, you know, there has been a vote uh, at this stage. It looks like one that is uh, possibly going to be uh, continuing uh, with the government. But as I said, there's a lot of votes to be counted. But I don't for a moment think that there's a satisfaction out there with the government. Uh, but there is a lot of nervousness about COVID, a lot of concern, you know, rising from the bushfires. In those circumstances, it's always going to be a challenge. And I think we've, we've seen that across governments of all description, Liberal and Labor, state and territory. With those criticisms, those dissatisfactions that you point to, I think you said there is not a satisfaction with the government. How then do you explain what seems to be a worse result for your side of politics, which could lead and will lead by the looks to 23 years of Labor leading? Yeah, as I said, uh, I think it's challenging times. And I think that with COVID, uh, it's clear that a lot of the swing voters People who are, you know, wondering whether it's time to change their vote have had a, uh, you know, decision to make. And in the circumstances where you see across the board, uh, in Victoria and New South Wales and other places, and you see the polling, uh, incumbent governments are, you know, the beneficiaries in a sense uh, because people are looking for stability. Uh, so if you're in opposition, presenting new faces, presenting a new agenda, presenting new positives, no, uh, new agenda, no matter how positive. It's always going to be challenging in those circumstances. So just to clarify, is it purely incumbency during disasters that you're sheeting this loss down to, if in fact that's what it will be? Look, you know, if, if the preference flow doesn't favour us, uh, then obviously the Liberal Party will go through a process and look at what the factors were, uh, where we may have uh, done better, uh, you know, where, where we could have picked up votes, and that's a process, I suppose, that will happen uh, if we are unsuccessful. But you know, at this stage, uh, I'm very much looking at where those preferences flow. Uh, a lot of uh, the seats are too close to call, uh, so we've got to see how that all plays out. Uh, could you have done a better job than Mr Coe this last four years, and do you want the leadership back? Look, I, I can assure you no-one's focused on leadership issues. Everyone's focused on the results tonight. Uh, we've all worked very strongly together as a team. Uh, and that's one of the great privileges that I've had. In my own seat of Murrumbidgee, I think we've had the best group of candidates for that seat that I've ever seen. Now, it doesn't look like we're going to get the third seat that we wanted. That doesn't mean they weren't a fantastic group of people uh, and that we ran a good campaign. And I think across the board, uh, I think it's been a good effort by the Liberal Party. But it's, you know, we've always been up against it uh, in the circumstances that we've seen, not just in Canberra, but across Australia, regardless of uh, which government is in, uh, in power. Uh, at the moment, the current situation favours incumbents. Jeremy Hansen, more discussions to be had in the wash-up and some difficult questions to continue to face. Thank you for your time this evening. Thanks very much. OK, so a reluctant Jeremy Hansen, not fully wishing to concede, certainly not wishing to jump ahead of his leader, Alistair Coe. We don't have any intelligence for you on Mr Coe's intentions nor his movements, but we will keep you up to date as soon as any information starts to reach us about uh, what's going on at Liberal HQ. But it does invite me to turn to Vicky Dunn on our panel here. And Vicky, as an outgoing MLA, you've been uh, frank and forthright in some of your analysis earlier on in the evening. So let's go to the points that are raised in Adam's question there. Mm -hmm. The future of the Liberal Party, uh, the direction, the, the leadership, how sweeping do you expect the changes to be coming out of tonight? Look, I think that, uh, as I said before, Greg, I, I actually agree with, um, with Anthony's analysis and that we can't win from here. Um, I think I also agree with, uh, with Jeremy that, <clears throat> that we, there's still a lot of counting to do. All those paper votes have to be scanned and the distribution of preferences <coughs> and the Gregory fractional transfers and all of those things, <coughs> and it is a complicated process. <coughs> um, and I think that we will be as is often the case, down to the wire on the last day, waiting for the, the last postal votes to come in. But, be, but best case, you're talking but, going but from 8 to 10 or yes, 8 to but 11. I, 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 but, that's an, and it, but it's still, you know, 10 seats is, is not what we want. We, we wanted 13. Yeah. 8 would be terrible. Um, and, and I'm not prepared to call how many seats we, mm. we look like getting yet. Um, but I think that it will be a time for assessment and reassessment about... Um, I, I think that the campaign 
was was great. But I'm not a campaign expert. Um, I'm a you know I'm a policy wonk, and I know about how electoral systems work. But I'm not a campaigning expert. Um, and I, I think that there is there is will have to be some real soul searching mm -hmm. about whether the, whether the campaign was good enough. I think that it's clear that it wasn't good enough. Uh, and I'm, but I'm very surprised at some of the very good campaigners who seem not to be doing well. Well, Vicky Dunn, it's an interesting point because <coughs> through your 19 years, you do understand the broader Gin and Dara electorate and Canberrans as well. Mm. I mean, an open question, how much did the stunts, the one-liners, the repeated verbatim answers to various questions respect the electorate? Look, I, I think that, uh, that the campaign was was conducted with a high degree of respect. It was conducted with really strong policies because we wanted to make people's lives better. Now, I, I guess in terms <coughs> of respect, I'm trying to ascertain whether you feel the campaign and its narrow and very disciplined approach respected the intelligence of Canberrans. Well, I, I, no, I, I think that um, one of the things that one of the things I do know about campaigning is you don't change a campaign halfway through. Sure. If you've struck, if you've come up with a campaign strategy, you stick to it. Even, even if you start to realise that may be the wrong strategy. I don't think anyone thinks it was the wrong strategy. But Do you, the, though? No, I don't. I, don't. I didn't think it was the wrong strategy. I thought it was the right strategy. And the thing that... <clears throat> and, you know, back in 2012, when Zed Seselja led the party and we said, Labor and Greens will triple your rates you know, until the cows came home and no one believed us. Mm. They believe us now, six years down the track, because the rates revenue has tripled. So how couldn't you and, take advantage and, of that and if that And the thing fact is that there? really that there was much of what we did in terms of sticking to your message was what we did in 2012. And I think that that is a testament mm. to the campaign team mm. because without incumbency and without the position, without the sort of the the boost that COVID gave an incumbent government, and you've seen it with Jacinda Ardern, I mean, the National Party in, in New Zealand made no traction this year, apart from mm. the fact that they were pretty hopeless. Since Bill English has gone, they have been hopeless. Um, but the, the other parties don't make any traction in a, in a crisis like this. And I think that that combined, mm. that is why you have to have a very strong campaign that sticks to its message. Looks like your colleagues on the panel are pretty keen to I incorporate their comments into this. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure Shane will disagree. <laughs> well, I think the, the thing we've seen is Alistair has stuck in such a disciplined way to his mm. single message mm. that I actually think it started to become a bit embarrassing mm. at some point. If we go to the leaders' debate, which you, of course, moderated at, and the very first question out of the box, you said, you asked Alistair a quite direct question and he went straight to the campaign message and he so clearly did not answer the question that I think it started to become a credibility issue as the campaign went on. You know, I admire the discipline and the single message they stuck to. Mm. It takes a lot of effort to do that, but I think in failing to answer those other questions, the electorate started to see that there was perhaps not much behind the slogans. Mm. Mm. I, I think I, think I, I disagree. I, I would, well, yeah. I, I just build on what Shane said. I think you asked earlier, Adam, about the... It was very clear what the Liberals were promising, but not clear why. I think what wasn't clear was how. So how do you lower, lower taxes, deliver better services, don't have more debt? Alistair Coe entirely failed to answer that question every single time he was asked. And he was asked at every single press conference and he failed to answer that question. No one ever and asked no the one, Labor Party. And no one believed the growing the pie answer because it just didn't make sense. It didn't add up. Um, and it probably also didn't really play to some of the people who would have wanted to vote Liberal but who don't actually want our population to be growing rapidly. Mm. So it, it kind of was, was a, a negative message it for those It was very people. interesting, though, that no-one ever asked the Greens how they're going to pay for that and no-one ever asked Andrew Barr how he's going to pay I, for I did well, press both the leaders at various occasions about whether it was debt, whether it was increased in taxes, mm. that, those sort well, of matters, debt, to try and pay for already, these sorts of yes. things. So that was, I think, a recurrent issue with all major parties, which goes to the heart in the COVID time, Greg, mm. how this stuff happens when we're all under financial pressure a lot, some people a lot more than others. Yeah, sure, and you can talk about pies growing, but the sheer fact of this pandemic is that borders are closed. Interstate migration is of itself 
difficult and unless Canberrans start becoming particularly amorous, uh, you're then <laughs> looking at natural reproduction to do the work for you. So uh, yeah. I'm not sure what The Economist would tell us about all of that, but there were always a few challenges to making uh, the economics stack up on some of those promises, I suppose. But we are reaching that point in the night where all eyes will turn to the re relative uh, functional, relevant functions of each of the two major parties. We have reporters at both, of course. Dan Borsha is at the Labor Club in Bell Conan, and Tom Lowry is keeping across the Liberal function at one of the hotels near Civic. So let's hear from them about what they're picking up on the ground. Dan, to you, first of all, word reached us, I assume, from you about the movement of Andrew Barr towards the club. But uh, take us back a step from there. I think it was about 10 to 8 that Anthony Green made his prediction about the return of a Barr Labor government. How was that greeted? Uh, Greg, there were ecstatic scenes here at the Labor Bell Conan Club where there was enormous applause, people standing up, all very COVID safe, I might add, and really making uh, the point and starting to talk about the future. I could see smiles and grins on people's faces where before that there had been a little bit uh, perhaps of angst, a bit of uh, not knowing exactly what was going on particularly because the numbers, Greg, have been coming through so quickly. They've been rushing through and everyone's been glued to your coverage right here. Now, in addition to this, we know that the Chief Minister, Andrew Barr, is right now on his way here to the Labour Bell Conan Club, along with his husband, Anthony, his mum and his dad, his brother and sister-in-law, as well as their two small children. You've probably seen those kids in the campaign throughout the last couple of weeks. They've become quite a staple of some of the media reporting. Now, uh, my understanding is, Greg, when they arrive here at this club, they'll be heading upstairs to a room to meet with the staff of Mr Barr. They'll be looking at the speeches, starting to think about framing that. We are told there's a special song for the arrival of Andrew Barr <laughs> to this event right here. In addition to this, uh, Greg, we're hearing that the call has not been made, or at least if it has, we, it hasn't filtered through to us here just yet. That's, of course, the call from the opposition leader, Alastair Coe, conceding defeat, uh, which really then is the catalyst for the speech that we're going to see here. Now, in addition to this, we've seen a number of high-profile members of ACT Labor leaving in the last little while. The Attorney-General, Gordon Ramsay, just left a couple of minutes ago, along with all of his family. We're told that's because he's got a large amount of people at his home and he was expecting to be able to leave a little bit earlier. Beck Cody, though, left with her family and entourage much earlier when those first numbers started to come through showing that things were perhaps not looking great for her. So a couple of empty tables here, but you'd have to say, Greg, that the rest of the tone, the theme here is quite ecstatic at this stage. Right, that's a very comprehensive update and you've got us on tenterhooks now. What will this theme song be, Dan Borsha? We're, uh, we're waiting to hear, but what we do know is that you will be at the happy end of this story located where you are, and that will be juxtaposed, I suppose, after the text messages and the contact between uh, Mr Coe and Mr Barr. It's going to be just juxtaposed with what Tom Lowry is seeing at uh, one of the hotels mm. in Civic. So uh, thank you to Dan Borsha there at the Labor Club, and that's the natural segue to Tom Lowry. Tom, I can tell uh, just in initially hearing the audio from your location that there is a vibe present at the Belconnen <coughs> Labor Club that appears to be absent where you are. Yeah, I think Dan described it as ecstatic at the uh, Belconnen Labor Club. It's definitely very subdued here. There really hasn't been a great deal of emotion showed. Even when Anthony Green called the election some time ago, it wasn't like groans broke out across the room. I think from the moment those first wind development numbers came through much earlier tonight, there was a, a certain sort of, uh, you know, a realisation within the Liberals that this probably wasn't going to go their way tonight. That being said, there certainly hasn't been a formal concession made. Um, I received a, a statement from a Liberal strategist um, with Hare Clark, we need to wait it out and see the results. The paper ballots appear to be favouring the Liberal Party, so there's still a lot of water to go under the bridge. We know that a number of swing voters were concerned about changing the government during a pandemic, despite having strong concerns about the direction of Labor and the Greens. So, no concession, but a hint there, a suggestion that, look, 
the pandemic is to blame for the result being seen by the Liberals tonight, which uh, I think is something we're going to hear a lot more of over the coming days and weeks. But, but no formal concession from the Liberal Party as yet. They want to see all the votes counted, and yet we haven't heard of any contact between Alistair Coe and Andrew Barr. As you heard from Dan, the Chief Minister is on his way to Belconnen, but we haven't heard that from the Liberals just yet. We expect we will hear from Alistair Coe, we just don't have any timings. OK, well, we're going to let you go, Tom, so you can keep your ear to the ground, because it is reasonable to anticipate that the Liberal can speech... Well, let's not use the word concession, but Liberal speech uh, will be coming before Andrew Bars and Tom and his team will keep us abreast of that. But there are a few moving parts uh, around our region at the moment. There's ACT Votes 2020. There's also news developing from New Zealand. So we're going to take a brief pause from the National Museum of Australia. Let's get the latest news now from ABC News Channel with Mariam Saab. Thanks, Greg. You're watching ABC News. We're taking you to New Zealand now, where Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has been speaking in the wake of today's election. New Zealand has shown the Labour Party its greatest support in at least 50 years. We have seen that support in both urban areas and in rural areas, in seats we may have hoped for, but in those equally we may not have expected. And for that, I only have two simple words. Thank you. Thank you to the people who worked so hard to share our message who volunteered for us in what felt like an endless campaign. Thank you to the candidates and members of Parliament who worked not just for six weeks, but for three... Well, earlier, New Zealand's opposition leader Judith Collins conceded defeat in the country's general election. With the majority of party votes counted, Jacinda Ardern's Labour Party has taken close to 50% of the vote, compared to around 27% for the National Party. National Party leader Judith Collins said she had phoned the Prime Minister to offer her congratulations on what she said was an outstanding result. When I became leader three months ago, we had to work very quickly and with confidence during a very difficult series of events. Thank you for always backing me and having to make the decisions that we ended up having to make. A big thank you to the national MPs. Thank you for backing me to be your leader. Thank you for supporting me and each other through what has been a gruelling and long campaign with the added difficulties of lockdowns and COVID and changing circumstances. And for those who are leaving us this election, can I say that you will be missed? Returning home, homes and businesses on Sydney's northern beaches have been evacuated after a hazard reduction burn jumped containment lines this afternoon. 300 people were ordered to leave as a precaution. At one stage, the blaze on North Head reached Watch and Act level before favourable conditions helped fire crews bring the flames under control. Turning to the weather around the capital cities for tomorrow, mostly sunny in Brisbane, showers for Sydney and Canberra, cloudy in Melbourne and Hobart, an overcast day too for Adelaide, mostly sunny for you in Perth and a possible storm for Darwin. Well, that's the latest from ABC News. I'm Mariam Saab. We'll take you back now to ACT Votes. Meet Betty, the imposing Cupid doll, standing proud and fully eight metres tall alongside the replica skeleton of the Muttaburrasaurus. Betty was one of a dozen Cupies who spun their way around Homebush Stadium at the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, draped in a kilometre of fabric. Some may remember that she and her fellow Cupies twirled to the strains of John Paul Young singing Love is in the Air. Sambas were danced and conga lines of top flight international athletes made their way around the stadium. You're watching ACT Votes from the National Museum of Australia. 
where we have a returned bar Labor government and we cannot say that there'll be any conga line dancing either here at the museum, uh, maybe a little at the Labor Club tonight. Let's uh, see what happens over there. But the call has been made. The numbers, while a little sketchy around the edges, point in the view of our chief election analyst, Anthony Green, to the certain election, re-election of a Labor government for six consecutive assembly terms. So that's the frame for all of this. Anthony Green, why don't you take us back with the, the summary and then into uh, a few seats? Yep. All right. The totals for the ACT overall at the election. Uh, just sometimes it gets a little finicky like that when he hasn't touched for a while. All right. Um, Primary, there we go. This will be it. Um, <laughs> that was an operator error. 38.4 <laughs> for the Labour Party, 33.1 for the Liberals, 13.8% for the Greens, 14.7 for others. And if you look at the change in vote, the Labour vote's roughly static. It's been a drop for the Liberal Party and a rise for the Greens. A lot of that in the central seats. Though the Greens have done well in Brindabella and other areas as well. If we look at the Chamber, we are now giving... We're starting to sort of firm up on who we, which seats we're giving away. We're giving the Labor Party a definite uh, 10 seats, the Greens three, and we're saying that we're highly likely that Labor goes up to 11, Greens three, and that gives 14 of the 25 members. So it'll be a slight increase on the majority at the moment. The Greens gain a seat. Uh, the Labor Party may gain, uh, we think, has gained a seat as well. They might have lost one in Europe, gained one in Brindabella, but there's a, a bit more to and fro to go, to, to and fro to go there. The difficulty is the Liberal Party has gone backwards in several seats. And, and it can't win three seats in any of the uh, five electorates. Um, just a, so a few comments on members we're saying have elected. We're pretty confident that Tamus Werner Gibbings is the new member for Brindabella, replacing Andrew Wall from the Liberal Party. Emma Davidson replaces Karen Lacuccia in Murrumbidgee. Marisa Patterson replaces Beck Cody on the Labor ticket in Murrumbidgee. And in Yerribee, we think Aaron, Andrew Braddock will win the final seat for the Greens in Yerribee. Um, some defeated members, as I mentioned, Beck Cody and Andrew Wall have been defeated. And I'm not sure, we haven't got any more listed as possibles, but at the moment, that's what the, uh, the overall position is. Um, filling in the dots there, but the Labor Party's definitely back with the Greens uh, in the balance of power, an improved position for the Greens. And I think by the end of the count, the Liberals would have gone slightly backwards in seats. Yep, that's a really enhanced position for the Greens, which invites a conversation with Shane Rattenbury, the Greens leader, who is soon heading off to the Polish club in Turner. This is where their function will be. We'll also be chatting mm. while he makes his way there to our reporter, Nada Gilmore, who's standing by. Just before we introduce Shane Rattenbury, though, word has reached us that Andrew Barr, the Chief Minister, has arrived at the Labor Club in Belconnen and, as Dan Borsha explained a little earlier, the, uh, the expectation was that he would go into private room and await some further developments before uh, delivering a speech. Possibly around 9 o'clock we're hearing uh, that the Alistair Coe, the Liberal leader, may be making his speech, so you can set your clock forward from there as far as the Chief Minister is concerned. So, Shane Rattenbury, before we bid you farewell for the evening, congratulations. This is, you're not going to say unexpected, but it is a really solid result. Emma Davidson, Andrew Braddock and yourself, three Greens, powerful position. Yeah, look, we're very pleased with this result, obviously, Greg, and with a couple of other seats still on the balance. I think that earlier Anthony was talking about possibly Re Rebecca Vassarotti joining me in, in Karajong. And I still think Joe Clay's a chance in Ginandera. So it points to us having a strong team. One of the struggles, as I said earlier, in just having two members is being able to work on everything we'd want to work on. This will give us much more capability to represent the views. I think it's, a, for us, a real endorsement of having bold ideas, putting forward a really positive agenda. We've been very clear about the fact that there is a role for government in this city uh, and probably counter that opposition of small government, which is what we've seen from the Liberal Party. I think also the federal budget did not help the Liberal Party in terms of this town. We saw a federal budget that was all about the trickle-down effect. It promoted gas as a climate response, which it clearly is not. Gas is simply another fossil fuel. We've campaigned strongly to phase out gas in this city. Those sort of things, I think a range of those factors have pointed to this is a city that wants serious action on climate change and they see a very constructive role for the Greens in working with the Labor Party but also in, I guess, the creative tension that comes from that partnership. 
by mere nature of you in the ministry for the last four years, Shane Rattenbury, points that you've been a pragmatic leader, that overt ideology and yelling at the sky is not your style. Is it very important that the Greens continue that approach to stay relevant in the ACT? Because voters here will not suffer people who are ideological at either end of the spectrum. Yeah, we've always taken that balance of power responsibility very seriously, Adam. It is a, a significant weight, uh, one we take uh, with, with a degree of humility, but knowing, understanding the significance of it. Uh, similarly, the role in Cabinet, it's, it's still quite new for the Greens. There have not been many Green Cabinet Ministers across the country. There's probably, uh, I think, only three of us so far. Uh, and so that's also been a learning journey for us. We've worked very hard to make sure that we delivered uh, to reflect the opportunity we've been given in the Have cabinet. you made mistakes in that journey as well, as far as your execution of policy, the things you have or have not done in the ministry? I think you have to always be honest with yourself. And I look back at some things and I wish I'd done them differently or done them a bit better. Nothing particular strings to mind. I don't think there's been any significant missteps, but there are always things where we can learn better. Through this campaign, we've had very strong feedback from the community that's both been supportive, but they've also been clear with us that they expect us to push the government. They expect us to raise community voices, to raise some of those controversial issues, whether it's been issues of planning and development, which there's a lot of frustration within the city. You share the Liberals' concern with that. You're we on do. a sim we somewhat do. unity ticket with that sort of thing. We are not getting the planning outcomes we need in this city. People are frustrated by the, the rate of development and particularly the nature of some of the developments, the loss of green space. That's something that's very dear to our heart, but we've struggled to make an impact on that. We'll carry that feedback forward. That last point then, should you end up holding balance of power, will you be seeking even demanding two members to be ministers, not just you? Look, that is something we will need to consult with our party with this week. We will have a meeting of the members. It's one of the real uh, privileges of being a member of the Greens. We don't just make these decisions in the parliamentary rooms. We'll actually sit in a community meeting room mm. here in Canberra uh, one night this week and consult with our members about their expectations, whether they want us to continue in the Cabinet or not, whether we should go to the crossbench. These are the discussions that we need to have as a party and with our members before making a final decision. It's also about having that conversation with the Labor Party and what they want to do going forward and building a four-year agenda. This is not about the next few weeks. This is about the next four years and making sure we have a stable and productive government for this city. Uh, just to pick up your point, before we let you go, Shane, clearly it is a decision for the members, but uh, your preference when it comes to sitting on the crossbench or being in the tent, just to put it explicitly, your preference is to be in the Cabinet, in the tent? Well, I've sat in the Cabinet for two terms now. It is an enormous privilege and there's great opportunity in holding those ministerial portfolios in terms of not only having the ideas, but the opportunity to implement them and do it in a way that, as the Greens, we think we do bring a different flavour to that. Mm. Um, and we, we are very encouraged and, and, frankly, humbled by this result tonight in terms of the endorsement from the community of the role we have played. Yep, one more for you. I just, just want to interrupt this conversation to say that our reporters out in the field have established that Alistair Coe, Alistair Coe has conceded, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I don't know by what means, but it, it's not a speech. Quite obviously, it was a phone call, text message, I believe a phone conversation to the Chief Minister, Andrew Barr. So Alistair Coe has made a private concession to uh, his counterpart and that will pave the way inevitably for him to make his way to the Liberal function and then we would bring you the public version of that or whichever way that Mr Coe chooses to express it. Uh, yeah, so just on portfolio, sorry Shane, um, you've spoken about your frustrations about planning. Is that a role you'd like to take on? I mean, Greens <laughs> as a planning minister, it's, it's not... <laughs> it's not easy to calculate in my mind. I think it would be a very challenging task. I think <laughs> if it was to happen, there would need to be a clear understanding between the Labor Party and the Greens of the reforms that need to be made. Uh, we have, of course, ourselves brought legislation forward this term to make reforms this past term in the planning system, and they were defeated by the Labor and Liberal Party combining together. And this has been, for us, one of the areas of real frustration. So I think we will... Both parties, the Labor and the Greens, have had really strong feedback, especially in Karajong, this election, about people's concern about planning issues. And we're going to have to sit down and have a discussion about what changes we're going to make because there has to be change in this space. All right. Well, all of that lies ahead for you in the negotiating room. But first comes 
uh, party grouping that's very eager to see their leader arrive at their function. <laughs> so thank you for your analysis and for your time, Shane Rattenbury. Once again, not the first election panel that Shane has joined the ABC for on ACT Votes, but we do appreciate your time and best of luck for the rest of tonight and the years ahead. Thanks very much, Greg. I think there's a pretty good vibe going up at the party, so I'm keen to get over there. <laughs> OK, just because you mentioned that, we're going to check in on that. Let's uh, fact-check that, as they right. say, <laughs> with Nada Gilmore, our reporter at the Greens function at the Polish Club, I believe. Nada, the atmosphere, Shane Rattenbury's talking it up ahead of his arrival. <laughs> I, think, I think he's passing the fact-check right now, Nada. You can't hear a thing. <laughs> OK, let's give Nada. Go on, Nada. Um, needless to say, you said earlier about a conga line of dancing. I wouldn't rule it out here tonight. <laughs> the Greens are one very happy party in the ACT tonight. Um, the swing to the Greens, from the very early uh, votes that were coming in, there's been cheers erupting here throughout the night. I said going in that they were quietly optimistic. I don't know. I think they had some inside information because the predictions that they were telling me even yesterday have turned out to be uh, fairly close to the mark. So big celebrations here tonight and they are definitely looking forward to the arrival of their leader, Shane Rattenbury. Yes, yeah, so and nothing quiet... <laughs> there they go again. Nothing quiet about their optimism at this stage of the evening. Uh, what about... Uh, Not anymore. No, I don't know whether you'll pick them up, Nada, but uh, whether there's any uh, likelihood of the other successful candidates showing up there. So we're talking about Emma Davidson and Andrew Braddock. I imagine they would get a uh, ringing yep. endorsement if they were able to make it to the venue around the time that Shane Rattenbury does. Yeah, I think most are here. I know Emma Davidson definitely is here. She's been uh, mingling around the room and looking... More than quietly optimistic, I would say, at this point. So it's, it's been a good night for all. And, yes, the candidates have been here since early on in the night. Supporters, their campaign teams, everybody here has been very upbeat all night. It really says something, I think, about the way the Greens campaign as well, because something you notice in the ACT is there are no core flutes lining the roads um, representing the Greens' faces, but they are out there in the community and they are getting their policies through by door-knocking, talking to the community, and that's what... Uh, they've been telling me tonight, certainly, that it's very much a, 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 an electorate-based campaign and they've obviously run a strong campaign because it certainly has uh, broken through in this election. Yeah, it worked all right and they're looking like three MLAs. Yeah. But earlier in the evening when you were there, Nada, I know it was highly uh, qualified, but Anthony was even stabbing at numbers that might have had them, you know, up above five on some preliminary figures I'm just interested to hear mm. how that might have been received when it looked like the tide was lifting even higher for the Greens. As I said, Greg, from the very first vote, votes, I think when we had 1.2%, the, the first results up on the screen, the, the reaction from this room has not changed. It's been enthusiastic all night. I think they've seen <coughs> the level of the swing towards the Greens this election and... They're very happy. OK, well, there's a bit to happen there because anyone who knows Canberra knows that it's a pretty short drive in what I imagine is an electric vehicle. I'm not sure what Shane Rattenbury does drive, but he needs to make it from the <laughs> really? National Museum here to where you are, Nada, and our job will be to juggle all the events that are coming up, and there are a few of them. So we'll be attempting to bring the Shane Rattenbury speech uh, via your club there, Nada, that's the Polish club, but um, we'll let you go and uh, please keep us informed when I it's time to come back. I think they have some other speeches planned, so okay. you should be fine. <laughs> All right, no, thanks, Nada. And uh, as we farewell <laughs> Nada Gilmore, we are reminded by our Liberal panel member in Vicky Dunn that all is in place for Alistair Coe to make a speech at what is anticipated to be 9 o'clock at a hotel just on the edges of Civic. So you can see a shot if you're watching any of the televised forms of ACT votes. If not, I'll describe it to you. Uh, socially distanced Liberal members in blue shirts at this QT hotel on the outskirts of Civic. They look uh, fairly subdued, it might be said, as they await Alistair Coe's arrival and the speech that we will be endeavouring to bring live and then on the other side of the televised screen, 
This is for the people not uh, following our coverage on ABC Radio Canberra or on the ABC's Listen app, perhaps through iView, through ABC TV or through the news channel. We can describe the Labor Club in Belconnen <laughs> on the left side of the screen that will in due course have its leader, Andrew Barr, come from upstairs somewhere after he has listened to the Alistair Coe speech this evening. So more from our remaining panellists in Rachel Stephen Smith, Adam Shirley and Vicky Dunn in just a moment. Mm. But why not check in in this brief lull with Chief Election Analyst Anthony Green once more because he gave us an overview not so long ago on ACT votes. Let's take a dive into at least a couple of electorates. Anthony, why don't we begin with Gin and Dera? Yes, um, Gin and Dera. If you look at the party totals, <clears throat> again, the Labor's 2.44, the Liberals 1.55, the Greens 0.77, and the Bokal Party on 0.55. As I mentioned, if I look at the candidates, the problem for the Liberal Party is the highest polling candidate only has 0.54, and there's a gap to the second polling of 0.32. Um, the, the leakage of preferences out of the ticket from the bottom three candidates is, is, is still not electing Elizabeth Kickers. She needs all those preferences to get there and the second candidate, Peter, Ka Peter Kane, is getting knocked out before the end of the camp. Now, if it buries on 0.95, Quota is elected, re-elected. Tara Shane on 0.7 is re-elected. And Gordon Ramsay on 0.51 is also highly likely to be re-elected at the moment. On the preference count we've got, he is elected, and that looks likely. Joe Clay, there's a bit of a split in the green vote, but there's a lot more preferences staying in the ticket, it appears, plus preferences from other places. So it looks like there's almost... The preferences from the Belco party are just exhausting. They're not flowing into the Liberal ticket. Mm. Uh, so at this stage, it's looking like this will be three Labor, one Liberal, one Green in Gin and Dera, unless there's something remarkable in the votes to come. Um, but the preferences are working out at 3 one, one So a little bit of upside there potentially for the Greens in the seat of Gin and Dera. The other one we just wanted to visit, Anthony, was Currajong. Now that Shane Rattenbury has <coughs> left us, they were charging along strongly as a group, the Greens. Uh, what's the latest from Currajong? Uh, and they still are. 2.31 for Labor, 1.56 for the Liberals. The Greens, 1.45. Canberra Progressives, 0.3, who are sort of a leftish group. Um, there's also Animal Justice has got 0.09, 1.5% of the vote. Um, climate Change Justice hasn't done particularly well. Now, so there's quite a few vote parties there that have got preferences for the Greens, in particular Labor on 2.31 quotas. They're not electing three. They're surplus flows heavily to the Greens. Mm. If you look at the votes by candidate, Andrew Barr has 1.3 quotas. His preferences elect, along with some other preferences, elect Rachel Stephen Smith to the second Labor ticket seat. Shane Ratner is on 0.8, will be elected. Elizabeth Lee's on 0.56 and Candace Birch on 0.45. On the current distribution, Candace Birch gets defeated and Rebecca, Rebecca Vazirossi, the second Green candidate, gets elected. And that's because there's such a surplus from Labor and from parties like the, the Canberra Progressives are just flowing to the Greens. Mm. And if you look at the overall party totals, um, 1.56 versus 1.45, the Greens have got a better split of their vote with one candidate on 0.8. Once he reaches a quota, it's, it's just coalescing for the Greens slightly better. Now, unless, you know, on the votes to come, that changes slightly. But the, uh, the issue is just simply if the Liberals are struggling to win two seats mm. in Karajong and Jin and Dera, that's their problem. And it's just their, their vote has been too far below two quotas and that just hasn't been a lead candidate attracting enough mm. of the votes. Mm. Which uh, invites a question, I think, to Rachel Stephen-Smith as a successful or seemingly successfully re-elected <laughs> MLA for Currajong. Mm. Uh, it's a question that is, again, about Andrew Barr. He's, he's lifting all boats mm. there. The importance of that big name in any seat, but particularly in Currajong. Uh, mm. If we go back to the, the questions that Adam was asking earlier about that day, whenever it comes, mm when he moves on, uh, there's a power of work to be done by others in Karajong, including mm. yourself, to counteract this Andrew Barr factor uh, over the next four years. I'm not saying yeah. it's happening, by oh. the way. It's a very <laughs> hypothetical question. But. Yeah, oh, look, I mean, it's, you know, I look at that and I think, oh, you know, I only got that, you know, that much of a quota. But it is very difficult when you've got the Chief Minister in your electorate because he will, um, you know, he will attract those votes and I'm... I'm told that the preference flow is flowing to me and I'm, I'm, I'm being reassured that I'm 
OK. Do you work um, for that, by the way? Or is that... How, why, why is that a feature of preference flows, that they do come to you? Purely oh, I, your it's own... It's name recognition. Yeah. 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 It's absolutely name recognition yeah. in, uh, in Hair Clark. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think... Um, I think if I can just segue away from your question about Andrew, because I'm not going to answer it anyway, <laughs> as you probably know. <laughs> um, I just wanted to go back to something that Shane was saying, actually, around um, planning and development. Uh, I know that, you know, the Liberals have really based their um, campaign on cost of living and rates, but when I knock on the doors in Currajong, I do get that occasionally. I also get people saying, you've got to continue with tax reform, it's a very sensible policy. But the negative that I get about... Labor as a long-term government has been about planning and development. And even though we have a planning review and even though Gordon Ramsay as Minister for Building Quality has been doing a lot of work, we've done a lot of work over the next two years, we have a lot of reform still to implement around building quality and around planning reform. There is... That, I think, has fed into that it's time mm. factor mm. for Labor, but people not being confident to vote for the for the Liberal Party at this point in time. Well, and I wonder if that has also fed into an increase in the Greens' vote. They've no doubt worked hard. People are concerned about environment. But I suspect it's also a bit of out the it's time factor about mm. Labor is actually flowing if, into the Greens' I, vote. If Adam can indulge me, just one more question. Mm. Because if you go ahead with stage two of light rail, that necessitates... We know these are not just rail projects, they're building development projects, mm. as we can see along the line, all the way to Gungahlin. There's going to be an awful lot more planning on your plate, development on your plate, if that line goes ahead. Uh, but yet you're acknowledging it's a liability. Oh, no, what I hear from most people is not that they don't want to see... You know, growth, new new development, new housing being built. It's about quality, it's about urban design, it's about doing it well. And the Greens have a policy of even more infill than Labor. So we've got a 70-30 infill versus greenfield um, approach in our planning strategy. The Greens have been talking in this election about 80-20. Mm. So that's something we're going to have to have that conversation about. But what people really want to see is quality infill. There's another element in work. that, if I could briefly add, consultation is a key C word and it is a key criticism of your mm. government over the last four years. Mm. Will there need to be a few humble pills swallowed by yourself, by the Chief Minister and others to acknowledge that too often the government has not properly considered what Canberrans actually want in nuance, in overall makeup, mm. and that they need to listen better to what Canberrans are after. The Liberals have made this critique before and you're saying that's stuck to some degree. Yeah, look, I think that has. And I think there's been a lot of work done to change the way that we've consulted with the community. We've tried a whole lot of different things from citizens' juries through the, the online community panel. So engaging with younger people than would necessarily come to some of the evening mm. meetings or engage in traditional forms of What about the Canberrans who've grown up here, who've lived here in our senior age and feel left out of where Canberra's going? And I think, that's, I think there is a genuine issue and a real dichotomy in our community around those people who, who, are, who have a real affinity for the place that they have lived, maybe the place that they've grown up, but certainly the place they've lived for a long time. And what I've said when I was Minister for Urban Renewal and speaking to um, the, the, commu the Property Council in that regard is it is part of your identity where you live. Mm -hmm. So if you see that being threatened, of course you're going to react really strongly to that. Is it time for Labor and, to respect that more, though? Well, I think the problem is that when we actually go out and consult with the broad range of community, that's not the only voice we hear. And so we do need to be better at having the, com having the whole conversation and being really transparent. We've tried really hard. We've put everything online that we hear, but we still get the mm -hmm. feedback of well, that's not really what you heard because you didn't agree with us at the end of the day. And that is a challenge in any planning system, but it's something that I think we can at least ameliorate through a better system. Vicky Dunn, um, again, time for a bit of introspection about the Liberal Party. Uh, you've been a servant of it for so long and we are, you know, roughly in the zone of when Alistair Coe is expected to stand and make a speech, let's call it a concession speech. I imagine it will be, and viewers who are watching our coverage uh, you will see that we will be going to it live when he enters that room. But um, the Liberal brand in the ACT and 
that divide, which exists everywhere, it must be said, in the Liberal Party between conservative and moderate, uh, how successful as an insider to the last Assembly party room has Alistair Coe been in blurring those lines and those divisions within the party room? Or is this still a fault line within Canberra I, I Liberals? Think that I actually don't think it's a fault line. I, I think that... Um, I remember when I was first in the Liberal Party, someone said to me, tell me about the factions in the ACT Liberal Party. And there really aren't factions. There are people who roll up their sleeves and get on with things. And they might not agree on all the social issues. But actually, it's very interesting that, you know, the, the things that sort of the litmus test things that make you a conservative or a progressive, they are not the issues that we have dealt with in the last assembly. They have not been the issues that we have dealt with in this election campaign. The cost of living. The cost of living is not an, is not an issue that's conservative yeah, or progressive. Yeah. But in many ways, you could say it's very progressive because we're concerned about the people who are not making it, mm. who are not... who. And there are, you know, there is, there is a... The, the people on the, the bottom two percentiles in the ACT, it's still a significant number of people mm. and they are doing it tough because this is an expensive town. OK, well, you will out. start to see on ACT votes. Alistair Bruce Coe, 36 years old, born in the Royal Canberra Hospital, 1984, walking in with his wife, Yasmin. They're also the parents of two children, Annabelle and Angus, this is a difficult place to be for any leader on election night, defeated, but able to muster a few words for supporters and party faithful. Alistair Coe, Yasmin, will go live to the Liberal function. Good evening. Tonight marks the end of a tough campaign in a tough year. 2020 has seen bushfires, hail, COVID, and of course, an ACT election. I can confirm that I have called Andrew Barr and I have congratulated him on the campaign that he ran because by all accounts, it is highly likely that we have seen the return of a Labor Greens government. I wish him and his team and his husband, Anthony, all the very best for the future. Of course, so many people worked so hard to win government tonight. Of course, it has turned out that it is not to be. I want to thank the wonderful team of candidates that we have right across the ACT. You have all done an extraordinary job in extraordinary circumstances. To the team of MLAs that have fought so hard to hold this government to account and to represent the forgotten people of Canberra, I thank you so much for all that you've done over the last four years. I particularly want to thank all the families of the MLAs and the, and the candidates who often ride this journey tougher than the candidate themselves. As MLAs and candidates, we at least have the opportunity to have a voice. But for the candidates, families, it is often very, very lonely. I thank you for the support that you've given us along the way. I particularly want to thank the Deputy Leader of the Canberra Liberals, Nicole Lauder, for all that you've done for the Canberra Liberals over the last four years. Nicole has been a tower of strength for me and she represents Brindabella with distinction. And I congratulate you on your result tonight, Nicole. Yeah. 
There are still many votes to be counted and many, many votes to be distributed. The preferences will, of course, determine the makeup of the next assembly. The preferences, of course, from all the votes cast today, as well as the paper votes cast at pre-poll, are still to be counted. So there is still considerable hope that our seat count will grow even further. I want to thank John Caesar and the Management Committee for all that you've done to steer us through this time. I particularly want to thank... <laughs> I particularly want to thank Josh Manawatu for all that he has done to run the most professional Liberal Party campaign we've ever seen. The campaign was next level in terms of professionalism. It was a positive campaign where we outlined a clear alternative for Canberra. Of course, we suffered pretty considerable attacks throughout this campaign. And that's tough, but not to be unexpected. I want to thank the wonderful staff at the Legislative Assembly, but particularly the staff in my office, to Steve, David, Deborah, Azealia, Sarah, Ollie, Emily, Coffey and Joel, thank you so much for your loyalty, your support, your advice, your expertise, your experience, and your commitment to the cause. And I am, of course, eternally grateful for the extraordinary support that I have received from Yasmin and my kids, Angus and Annabelle. To be a parent in politics has its ups and downs. Uh, but to Yasmin, thank you so much for all that you have done to uh, keep me relatively sane <laughs> and, of course, for all that you do in raising our two beautiful kids. I also want to thank my parents, Bruce and Barbara, and my parents-in-law... <laughs> And my parents-in-law, Jerry and Karen. <laughs> Grandparents of Canberra do a lot of heavy lifting. And I am so grateful for the wonderful role that they play in our children's lives and, of course, in our lives as well. My passion to make Canberra the best place to live, work and raise a family burns strong. We all have an obligation to do absolutely everything we can to make this place more affordable, especially for those that are doing it tough. When I was elected to the leadership of the Canberra Liberals four years ago, I said that Canberra was at risk of becoming a two-paced society. One pace where people can keep up with the cost of living and another that is increasingly falling behind. That threat remains very, very real and it is incumbent upon the next government of the ACT to do much more to support those in this city who can't afford rent, can't afford to buy a home, are living in poverty or are doing it tough. Tonight, I thank the tens of thousands of people that voted Liberal. I know to be a Liberal in Canberra is not easy. I thank you all for flying the flag. I thank you all for the confidence, optimism and positivity that you've given this campaign. I joined this party 20 years ago. It is a party for the forgotten people. It's a party that represents the broad spectrum of people in this city. We are a diverse party 
and our candidates reflect that. We have to continue to do all we can to make sure that we represent a continually diverse, uh, a, a continually diverse Canberra. Our campaign was true to our values. It was positive. We advocated to empower people. We advocated to empower families. We advocated to empower communities. We must continue to do all that we can to make Canberra the best place to live, work and raise a family. It has been an honour to be the leader of the Canberra Liberals. It is the greatest honour of my life. I thank you so much for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I wish the Canberra Liberals all the very best over the years ahead. I look forward to being part of that journey and I look forward to doing everything we can to hold this government to account. Thank you. Gracious, measured and conceding that there is no path to government for Alistair Coe and the Canberra Liberals, a party that he joined in 2000 and was mentored and encouraged at the time by a then prominent Canberra Liberal in Bill Stefaniak. He's a young man at 36. Is Alistair Coe? But what is left hanging at the end of that speech is a question about whether he, or indeed his party, sees an ongoing role for him as leader in the new 10th ACT Legislative Assembly. Uh, along, on, on the way through, you know, he did talk about a campaign that had been based on Liberal Party values. He felt they stayed true to those and that they were positive as much as they could be. It's been an honour to be leader of the Canberra Liberals, he said, as he leaves the venue or perhaps just chooses to mix and mingle with a few supporters, still flanked by his wife, Yasmin. It is, as we said on the way in, a difficult place to be. So we'll hear from Anthony Green in a moment and we'll obviously be keeping an eye on what's coming in from Bell Conan with the last major missing piece of the puzzle <coughs> being Chief Minister Andrew Barr's speech. And we'll be bringing that to you live, of course. Uh, thoughts from all our panel, but Vicky Dunn, I'll start with you. How did those final sentences reach your ears? It didn't sound like someone emboldened to say, I'll be back. It kind of spoke about having a role because he's here for the next four years, clearly. Well, I think that it's not... Today is not the time to make decisions about your future. I mean, I think that there is a... There's often a perception that if you... You know, if, you, if the campaign doesn't work, that, you know, that you should go. And I disagree with that entirely. There is... You know, Alistair, and as you said, you know, he's, he, he's articulate, he's, he's compassionate... He's, and he's well supported, you know. Alistair and Yasmin have had conducted their entire marriage in the public mm. sphere. I mean, they, Alistair was a single man when he was elected. He's now married and he has two children. And you know, there's a, But there's also a lot for him to give. He's only 36, you know. I'm old enough to be his mother. <laughs> and, and I, well, and I would... That's perspective on you. And, 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 and that's the great thing about the campaign... ..about the, the Liberal Party... Ticket, you know, it's it's full of bright young people, you know, and there's there's a few sort of grey heads and grey beards as well, and I think that that's a that's a really good. Oh, I'm a sure good there's place a place for grey heads somewhere. Vicky oh, absolutely. Dunn, <laughs> he says, uh, Adam. And I think I think it's a great it's a it's, you know it's a great place to be, but this is not the time yep. for making decisions about you know what you do for the next four years. No, I accept that, and I, I pick up on that point, Adam Shirley, because there's just this received wisdom that a defeat is automatically the end for leader and so the churn goes on, you know, whether it's federal, whether it's here in Canberra. It need not always go that way. Not necessarily in this case. And Vicky makes a really salient point about the relative youth of Alistair Coe and that he has been a man in a hurry with momentum behind him as well. So reserve judgment on where it could go for the leadership at this point. 
But Vicky Dunn, I want to reference the campaign again. And you spoke of Alison Coe's intelligence, I think his empathy as well. And there is something in that. Was he played out of position with this campaign being so narrow? And did it curtail his ability to appeal to a broader range of voters? It's, it's interesting, though, and part of the thing is with Alistair's youth is that some people don't... Some people, and you saw there t tonight, you know, he was... He was stressed and tight, and, and of course you would be. And, and I think that, you know, there were, there were flashes in the campaign where you see the potential that he has, mm. and he shouldn't be walking And was it constricted by campaign headquarters in no, the kind of campaign that was run? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's about... It's about sort of stepping into your own comfort zone, and I, I think the, I was I was at the the, the um, leaders debate, mm. uh, and he was very tight and stressed there. But at the launch, at the campaign launch, where he spoke for 20, 25 minutes without a note and with, without any prompting, you saw a different person. Mm. And I think that the people of the AC, ACT still haven't got to know that Alastair Co. Unfortunately, and I think that it's, you know, sometimes people say four years is a long time in politics, you know, weeks a long time in politics, but still, when you're that young, there's a lot of growing to do. Which then begs the question, aside from COVID incumbency, what didn't stick for him, for the campaign, for your team? Um, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. I, when I looked at the campaign, um, there was... It had all the elements that I would expect to see in a campaign. Um, it had a, a coherence to it. It had a unity, you know. You didn't have res candidates going off the reservations. We're better... At, I mean, parties, generally speaking, are better at, at, at this sort of thing. Mm. But I don't see that there's, you know, there is a, there's one thing mm. that was, was fatal. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a combination of things, and I think we have to reinforce. Uh, I'm I'm sort of getting advice um, that some of those distributions of preferences are very tight, yeah, okay. and you know, and I sort of I look back at my own experience in in uh, 2001 on election night. I walked out of the the tally room saying to my husband Lyle, I can't win from here unless every preference goes the right way, and. Ten days down the track, it did. they mm. did, and I won by 54 votes. And there were a whole lot of very odd distributions of preferences. And there, and I'm, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing from our colleagues is that there are some very odd distributions of preferences. Mm. And I still cleave to my view that the paper votes, I think, will move towards us to some extent simply because of the demographic graphics of the people who are likely to cast paper votes. Yeah, we are at a fluid point in the evening and just to remind viewers of our ACT Votes 2020 coverage, we are seeing from the Labor Club in Bell Conan, the Deputy Labor Leader in Yvette Berry, doing what I imagine is an introductory speech for the arrival of Andrew Barr. Rachel Stephen-Smith, who's on our panel, has, indicating that that, it has indicated to me that that is expected to be imminent. Uh, she's tapped into text messages with party colleagues. There might just be enough time on the proviso that we have to cut you off and shut you down abruptly, Anthony Green, a chance to take a dip into Brinda Bella, where we've had you on hold uh, for a little while now. Yeah, um, look, there are f two Liberals and two Labor. Joy Birch and Mick Gentleman are re-elected for Labor, Mark Parton and Nicole Lauder for the Liberals. Now, um, Andrew Wall will be defeated. T Tamus Werner Gibbings, I had earlier thought he would win. I've been through and checked the distribution of preferences and there's only 36 votes difference between him and Jonathan Davis mm. of the Greens at a key point. So if there's any change there, then Jonathan Davis of the Greens would win it. There's no doubt it's Labor or the Greens at this stage, but I just thought I'd point that out, that, uh, that the Greens still have a chance in Brindabella, although they've come from a long way behind. No, important point of clarification. Anthony, thank you. We haven't heard the last from Anthony, even though we have to get through the Chief Minister's victory speech. We'll go through towards the end of our coverage and look at all the electorates, all five of them, around Canberra. Rachel Stephen-Smith, because we haven't got you to your <laughs> show yet, the Labor one, um, reflections on Alistair Coe as a worthy combatant, um, 
Yeah. yeah. If you want to comment on <clears throat> the last four years or even just on the performance of the campaign and the speech tonight. Oh, look, I mean, it, it's clear that Alistair Coe gave this campaign everything he had. And it's it's actually always difficult to watch a concession speech, especially from someone that, you you know, you know, even if you only know, you know, you know them across the chamber. And Alistair is a decent person and, and it's hard to watch, you know, people speaking, you know, who, who, you know his heart's broken in, and when you lose an election like this. And he's really given it everything he had. Um, but I, I think it is different in going to the conversation about whether people stand down after an election loss. I think it's different if you lose an election from opposition than if you lose an election from government. I think it's hard to go from... Um, yes. you know, I don't want to jinx any future, um, future decisions that might be made by anybody, but going from being... A le the, the leader, the Prime Minister or the Chief yes. Minister to opposition leader is really one thing. Going from opposition leader to opposition leader is a completely different thing. It can and be done. It, it can uh, be Shorten done. Did it. Um, and so I think, you know, Vicky's right that, to, you know, obviously it's a Liberal Party decision and it's Alistair's decision, but I don't think anyone should be rushing him into that decision. I don't think that would be right. I think he's done everything he could. I do think, though, that the Liberal Party does need to think about whether Alistair Coe represents the values that they need to project to the ACT community to win government in this town. And this is a very progressive territory. And we have heard it's not just us saying it, it's what we hear from people as we go out and talk to voters, that Alistair Coe doesn't represent the progressive values of this city. Now, that might not be fair, and I'm sure Vicky would say that's not a fair characterisation of how Alistair Coe would govern but it is his... The values that he represents don't necessarily represent the progressive values of our city, and I think people see a disconnect there, and I think that is something that he's going to have to reflect on and the Liberals are going to have to reflect on as they work through who might be the leader in, for the next four years. Is that even possible, though, Vicky Dunn, that the Canberra Liberals can find, to use Rachel's word, a progressive leader, um, while also being true to the values to which Alistair Coe just spoke? Well, I think that there... I mean, the interesting thing is that our party room is full of people who are true to Liberal values, mm. who are true to... But are they to, progressive in tune uh, and, with yeah, the rhythms look, of this that city? Some of, I think some of them... Some of them, you know, I would be characterised as conservative uh, and others would be ca characterised as not so conservative. Uh, but the thing is that the issue is... is you know, you might be, you know, you might be conservative, a, a church-going Christian, uh, or, or that doesn't necessarily make you um, not progressive. Not doesn't necessarily mean that you are not interested mm. in the plight of your fellow citizens. And that's what what we're here to do. We're here to serve. And Alistair put forward a, a comprehensive campaign of how we would serve the people of the ACT, the poor. The indigenous, the incarcerated, who were who are all left behind at the moment. I mean, you know, we spend a lot of time putting together policies in the care and protection system because we believe that the care and protection system doesn't look after our vulnerable children. We have too many indigenous children in the care and protection system, too many indigenous people in the in the prison system, mm. too many people who who are struggling too many homeless people. You know, we really need to sort of... When there are homeless people under the awnings of the ACT Legislative Assembly throughout the winter, you, you know, we have to be taking a real, a real look at... a good look at ourselves and what we're doing wrong. And that problem has got worse mm. over the past four years. Now, the people of the ACT have spoken. They haven't spoken... The final word hasn't been heard yet, and I think that there is still a lot of counting to go. Um, and maybe we, f we fail to articulate that enough, but what our campaign was about was about the Indigenous person who shouldn't be in prison, mm. the mental health patient who ends up in prison, the kids in the care and protection system who have, you know, and once you're in the care and protection system, there are, you know, you don't have great social outcomes. And everything that we did was about that, yep. yeah, and and that 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 is that is not a progressive conservative yes. thing. That you is can't about build that about construction. Hey, yeah, on that's right.
fundamental social justice issues. Yes, so just a bit of uh, maintenance of the clock for you. It looks, and I think you can understand the reasons for this, it looks as though the Chief Minister, Andrew Barr, is wanting to play tonight by the book. Uh, how is that expressed? Well, it's expressed by holding fire on your victory speech until another important player this <laughs> evening in Greens leader Shane Rattenbury is given time to make his speech. <laughs> Don't call it a victory speech, but he's doing that. <laughs> Let's go to Shane Rattenbury Hello, Bruce, live. How are you all? Twenty twenty has been a year where there has not been a lot of good news, but tonight bucks that trend. <laughs> tonight, Canberra has voted for a better normal. They... <laughs> Canberra has voted for a positive agenda for this city for an agenda that is about being bold, about looking forward and about tackling the big issues that we know are out there. Through this campaign, we have said now is not a time to snap back to the old normal. It has been a hard year for so many Canberrans, but we don't want to go back to the way it was. We want to deal with the climate crisis that sits there in the background. We must deal with the growing inequality in our society and we must deal with issues of housing affordability in this city. That is what we've said through the campaign and that's what Canberrans have backed up tonight. And that is the agenda we are going to take into the new Assembly. <laughs> I do want to thank Caroline Lacuda who's here tonight. Yeah. This is not a success we've built in the last few weeks or the last few months. This is a success that has been built up since the Greens were launched in the 90s and through the successive MLAs and most recently with Caroline. So, Caroline, we celebrate this with you tonight. Yeah. I am absolutely thrilled to have you members joining us in the Assembly. Emma, Andrew, Rebecca... And probably I still think Joe and Jono. Yeah. That will give us the capability in the Assembly to tackle the issues we want to, to work with the community more, to be out there in the community and to bring green ideas and community ideas into that parliament every single week that it sits and every single day that we hold our seats there. Tonight is a chance for us to stop and celebrate, but it's also a time to reflect on why we've been supported and the job we have to do. This has been an extraordinary year. We started the year impacted by climate change. There is no doubt that that is what we went through at the start of 2020. For someone who's worked on climate change issues for a long time, what we saw at the start of the summer was deeply sobering because I always thought it was an issue I was working on for future generations. To experience that in our own lifetimes is a sobering thing and it underlines the fact that every single day the Greens stand in a parliament, climate change is at the forefront of what we think about and that is what we have to continue. The ACT has come a long way. We are one of the elite jurisdictions on the planet when it comes to reducing our emissions but we cannot stop. Now is the moment to underline the fact that gas is another fossil fuel and we need to wean up our city off it, we need to tackle our transport emissions and we need to be very clear to the federal government that we don't want a gas-led recovery. We want a renewables-led recovery. The ACT is the answer to the travesty we saw in last week's federal budget, which was a trickle-down budget, a gas-led future, and one that completely ignored the desperate need for more social and community housing in this country. The ACT can show what is possible, what is different, and how we can provide the complete counter to what we saw out of the recent federal budget. Tonight is a night to reflect on that, but as I say, to not forget what Canberrans have put in our hands. They have entrusted us to take forward an agenda that we put to them in this campaign, an agenda that is about being bold, it's about being fearless, it's about knowing that we can build a better normal for this city and in setting that example for this country. Yay! 
I do want to take this moment to acknowledge some of the colleagues from the Assembly who have lost their seat at this election. It is a hard night. We've been through it before as the Greens, and there are a number of members out there tonight who have lost their seats. Uh, I know them all, of course. It's a small parliament, and I, I will have a chance to catch up with them in the coming days, but we thank them for their service for the ACT. I also extend my commiserations to Alistair Coe and the members of the Liberal Party. They have fought incredibly hard in this campaign. I went into tonight nervous. They have put their heart and soul into this campaign. We disagree with them, but I know that they're all passionate Canberrans, and I know they will be sorely disappointed by tonight's results. And I wish them all... I want to acknowledge the members of the Labor Party, who we have, of course, formed the government with. Again, we don't always agree with them. Uh, but we've worked closely with them for the better of Canberra. Uh, they have worked incredibly hard. There's some new Labor members coming in, and I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Andrew Barr as the Chief Minister who we have uh, worked with. Uh, I've received a call from Andrew congratulating us on our strong result and uh, flagging his... his um, looking forward to the conversations we're going to have this week. <laughs> uh, we will be having an interesting conversation. I, We've had some really clear feedback during this election from members of the community who are not entirely happy with how things have been going. We have to take that on board as well. And there are things we need to reset on and we need to reflect on. And I really thank people who've come up to us in the election campaign and given us that feedback. They've been really blunt at times. It's not always easy. But we have listened to you and we will take that feedback with us into the Assembly and take that challenge with us to do better and to do more. It's been a strange night sitting up there on that panel on TV watching you all celebrate down here. I'm really pleased to get here and join you. Uh, maybe have a refreshing beverage or two. Friends, this is a, a victory for you as well. You've all worked incredibly hard, from the campaign team in the office to the just incredible number of volunteers who've been out there. This has been a really fun campaign. We said at the start we want to have some fun, and you have all made it fun. It's been so much fun working with you, being out there, talking to the voters of Canberra. So each of you absorb this moment tonight. We'll talk during the week about what it's, the details of what we're going to do next, but tonight is a night to enjoy it. I want to personally thank my staff in the Assembly. We've been together for a long time now. It's not always easy in there being the small party in a parliament where both other sides are trying to get something out of you. The politics of the day can be pretty tough. But that team has really stuck together uh, since particularly 2012 for my team, uh, I particularly want to thank our Chief of Staff, Indra Esguera. Yeah. Yeah. Indra represents everything this party stands for. Commit, absolute commitment to the cause, to the issues that we believe in. Absolute commitment to making sure that we build a more sustainable planet for our children and their children. And that's what Indra embodies in this party and we couldn't have done this without her. So I want to thank her. It's hard to describe the role she's played. I want to also thank my partner Louise. These election campaigns are pretty unforgiving on the partners. I just saw Alistair on TV with his partner, Yasmin. The partners do so much. I know Andrew Barr will say the same thing about Anthony. The partners really help us get through it because you come home some days, frankly, a little weary and a little frazzled, <laughs> and the partners are there picking up the pieces. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, she, she always has a birthday in election week. <laughs> it's very inconvenient, that. <laughs> but no, friends, let's... Let's wrap it up there. Thank you so much. Do celebrate tonight, but know that coming, starting Monday morning, we will be there working with the other members of the Assembly and the entire Canberra community to build a better normal for this city. Thank you very much. 49 years old lawyer, social justice campaigner, Greenpeace activist, super fit triathlete, <laughs> and now political party leader of the Greens in the ACT, which will meet in a party room containing more 
than just him and one other. We're looking at a scenario tonight where Shane Rattenbury comes back into the next assembly with at least two others and quite possibly a Greens party room, numbering three or four. At the extremes, five. Anthony Green signals to me here <laughs> that numbers as high as six are still eminently feasible for the Greens <laughs> party in the ACT. So um, we'll get a Anthony to explain that why that is just a little later. Uh, I just want to signpost to you, though, that uh, because we've cleared that hurdle of uh, nicety, that is that Andrew Barr, the Chief Minister, was waiting out of due deference for the Greens leader. Mm -hmm. And he right on cue, he's watched what we watched, and so it is, that Andrew James Barr, 47 years old, hand in hand with his partner, spouse, Anthony Toms, strides into the winner's circle at the ACT Labor Club in Belconnen. To the hugs and well wishes of caucus members. Bit of COVID safety there. Not a, <laughs> not a whole lot, it must be said, but enough to get through this night. On to the podium, Anthony Tom, Andrew Barr, Chief Minister, for six years and now entitled to stay for another four. Let's go to the Labor Club. Darwin Nuna, Darwin Nuna Wall. This is Nuna Wall country. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I do so with great humility at this election result tonight. Thank you. It is a humbling experience to lead a political party and to lead a government, and particularly in a year like this one. We've had an extraordinary series of challenges thrown at us as a city and as a community, and we've got through it because we've worked together. We've got through it because we've applied progressive values to our government decisions and because we've applied compassion we haven't left people behind. <laughs> These are values that we hold deeply as ACT Labor parliamentarians, members and supporters. These are the values that drive us every day to work for our community. 2020 has thrown so much at us. It has pushed our city to the limits. It's tested everything that we thought possible. And in this most challenging of years, Canberrans have turned to a strong and experienced government. And in 2020, Canberrans have voted to return a Labor government. <laughs> A short time ago, Alistair Coe uh, rang me to offer his congratulations. It's the most difficult phone call any political leader can make. And I want to thank Alistair for the dignified way in which that conversation took place. And I want to thank uh, he and all of his team for the campaign that they ran. It was a, it was a, a campaign that was based on their their values, and they weren't shy about putting them forward. And I wish he and Yasmin and their family, and indeed all of the elected members of the Canberra Liberals, well. And they've lost a few members tonight. And we, know, and we, know, no, no, we know what that feels like, and that's, that's challenging. And I want to acknowledge that a democracy only works if you have a strong opposition. Tonight also has seen a very strong result for the ACT Greens. I've spoken to Shane Rattenbury and we'll sit down, uh, Yvette and I, with Shane and his team 
uh, over the coming week to put together a new government for this city. But it will be a government that will be led by ACT Labor. Woo. It will be a government that will deliver on the commitments that we took to the people of Canberra. We said we would protect your health and we will protect your jobs. And that's exactly what we will do during this pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic is the greatest challenge that we've faced since self-government. But I'm so proud that our team and our government was there for people when it really mattered. We stepped in to protect Canberrans' health, their businesses and their jobs. And we're going to keep working with our community as we emerge from this global health and economic crisis stronger than ever before. Now, despite all of the noise that's been around this campaign, we've stuck to our positive message, a campaign focused on delivering more for Canberrans, not less. A campaign based on our progressive and inclusive values. A campaign based on ACT Labor values. Now, four years ago, in this very spot, I stood here and said that Canberrans had voted for light rail. <laughs> well, friends, they've done it again. <laughs> and I think Labor's resurgence on the south side tonight is testimony yeah. to justice. But no matter where in this city you are, you voted for a government that does what it says it will do. We've built light rail, we've opened nurse-led walk-in centres across Canberra and we've delivered 100% renewable electricity <laughs> for the <our> city. <laughs> Canberrans have voted for us to put jobs first. They've voted for more than 250,000 local jobs in Canberra by 2025. This, this is a core Labor value. The Labor Party always has and always will stand up for good, secure jobs in our city. <laughs> and I want to thank all of our affiliated unions and the broader Labor movement for their tremendous support during this campaign and their incredible work in looking after their members during the pandemic. <laughs> One very clear message from this campaign is that Canberrans have voted for real action on climate change. Yeah. They voted for this city to continue to lead our nation in implementing good public policy that creates jobs, reduces greenhouse gas emissions and reduces cost of living. They voted for us to lead on progressive reforms and to pull the rest of Australia with us. They voted for a government who will always stand up for Canberra and one that will listen to expert advice when it comes to handling this pandemic. I want to acknowledge in this election just how difficult politics is, how challenging it is to put yourself forward for public office, and I want to thank and congratulate everyone who stood in this election. Yeah. Everyone who stood in this election. I thank, I thank the ACT Electoral Commission for running a professional COVID-safe election that allowed people to participate. The fact that our informal vote was so low is testimony to how easy the Electoral Commission made it for people to vote. And this stands in marked contrast to what we are seeing in the United States at the moment in their presidential election. We must value our democracy. We must value our participation. 
and the right of everyone to participate and to be able to vote. And that's something that we can say very proudly, that our national capital leads this nation in the most inclusive democracy in Australia. Now, I know this, so many sacrifices are made by people who choose to enter public life. I congratulate all of the MLAs who are elected today. Thank you for your hard work and your passion for our city. Canberra is better for it. Thank you to our fantastic team of Labor candidates. It's just been such an honour to lead this team and to see you all at, so hard at work across so many months out campaigning all across this city. Our candidates can only do that, though, with the tremendous assistance of their volunteers. Thank you. You have made this victory possible tonight. <laughs> Grassroots campaigning was very challenging during a pandemic. But that didn't stop our innovative ACT Labor team and our supporters from working tirelessly to talk to voters and to share our positive plan for Canberra's future. Now I want to thank Yvette Berry, ACT <laughs> Labor's Deputy <laughs> Yvette, I wouldn't be here without your strong support. Your personal result tonight is testimony to how your community values you as their local representative. Congratulations. I look forward to working with you in the next time. <laughs> also, a shout out to my Chief of Staff, Michael Cook, and the rest of our office. <laughs> I thank everyone in my office. Mark, Matt, Karen, Fahim, <laughs> Yashina, Ben, Tanya, Britt, Nagata, and my extended team. <laughs> everyone, everyone who's worked so closely in my office, staff who've worked across multiple offices, who've supported so many candidates and MLAs during this time. Thank you. Without you, we would not be here. Politicians are only ever as good as the people who stand behind them. Thank you so much. <laughs> to Mel James, our fantastic <laughs> campaign manager, party secretary. I'm standing here because I listened to Mel's advice. <laughs> Great advice. And for her first campaign, it's a tremendous result and testimony to such fantastic hard work. So ably supported by Jared and the rest of the party office team. Thank you to Dee and Stuart at Campaign Edge. Get another river. I love working with you guys. And finally, to my husband, Anthony. <laughs> you are my rock. My life is so much better since we got married. <laughs> I think people think I'm a calmer and nicer person as a result. <laughs> we met in this city. We've been together nearly 21 years. About to have our first wedding anniversary. Anthony, I love you. <laughs> and to my, my parents, Susan and James, who are on the stage tonight. Whitlam Generation <laughs> University <laughs> graduates. I wouldn't be here if they weren't able to go to university because of the Whitlam government. 
They've made me who I am today, and I am so grateful for all of their support, always. <laughs> to my brother Ian, sister-in-law Natalie and Angus and Zoe. <laughs> your advice. Your ability to completely distract me and never get, never let a word in <laughs> at family lunch. It is like Chief Minister's talk back, except I never get to say anything. Thank you. Our families make us. Our families support us and, and get us through. So thank you. To the broader Labor family, it is it's such an honour to lead this party in this territory. Australia's most progressive jurisdiction a jurisdiction that leaves no one behind, a jurisdiction that will respond to climate change, a jurisdiction that will invest in health and education, and a jurisdiction that will always put good, secure jobs first. Thank you, everyone. Truly a family affair tonight for Andrew Barr, re-elected as Chief Minister of the ACT, just before his sixth anniversary in that position. The weight of leadership sits heavily on the shoulders at the best of times, and you get the impression that a little of that has lifted tonight by the exhilaration of a victory in a very difficult <clears throat> year for all concerned, not just within the Bar Labor government, but the Legislative Assembly and the ACT community as a whole. It was an inclusive speech that left no one out. Not Alistair Coe, not the candidates who stood, 137 of them, not the Electoral Commission, the volunteers, the staff, the spouse in Anthony Tom, and the extended family who accompanied Andrew Barr into the Labor Club at Bill Conan for this victory celebration and you'd have to think the night is young for the Labor Party members who Adam Shirley, one of our co-panellists here tonight, um, must have had a few niggling doubts. I'm uh, sure, sure conventional wisdom can be they were always going to pull this off, but... Uh, there must have been some nervous moments. I, I think there were, Greg, and Vicky Dunn and I had a discussion mm. recently that it's never been a red belt necessarily in the ACT. There's only a few thousand votes in it. And I'm pretty sure I detected a hint of emotion and relief within Andrew Barr's speech then. A man who's generally regarded as keeping his emotional cards close to his chest. I get the sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Rachel Stephen-Smith, that Andrew Barr and the, Lab and the Labor Party have done a little better than they might have expected because they know the Liberals tapped into a few key issues on cost of living, on the difficulty some Canberrans have had in keeping up with the increases in rent and the increases in health costs, etc. And they had a sense, one way or the other, that there might have been a price to pay, although it has not been paid tonight. Mm. Uh, look, I think our research indicated that we were likely to retain government. But it's hard to do research in the ACT and Hare Clark is brutal as well. Um, and so I think there is, there's always relief um, when, you, when you are able to claim victory in election. Um, even if you're expecting it, it's still a relief because it's, there's still so much nervous energy about what if we're wrong. And we've seen that before. We saw that in the 2019 federal election where everybody expected Labor to win and we didn't win. And so even though our research was telling us that people were likely to vote for Labor and wanted that experience and that stability and were really positive about Andrew, really, po like that came out really strongly in our research, the trust in Andrew, the understanding of his leadership and experience and how important that was at this time, you just don't know. And it has been, I saw Andrew this afternoon and he was pretty relaxed, but there's always that nervousness about it. Mm -hmm. I, I just Can I just take this opportunity, because I know um, events are wrapping up and um, as a result of COVID, the ACT Labor event had, was restricted in numbers and my own volunteers are um, together um, having an event. And I just want to give a big shout out to 
my staff and my volunteers, dozens of people who've worked really, really hard through the campaign, um, who've helped to get me re-elected, it appears. And I just really want to thank all of those people because Andrew's right, we don't... We, we, we only are here because of all of the hundreds of Labor volunteers who are out there talking to people all the time. Yep. I, also do, I also do want to acknowledge um, Mel James, who is my former Chief of Staff, who has done an absolutely outstanding job as Party Secretary. Uh, she's from Tasmania. She understands Hare Clark and, uh, and she understands campaigning. She's been doing it since she's knee-high to a grasshopper. So this is her first time as Campaign Director and she had big shoes to fill in Matt Byrne's shoes. Um, but she has really done an outstanding job. And look, I just want to, while I'm speaking, um, I do want to also acknowledge my colleagues who um, Anthony is projecting are likely to lose their seats. Um, Bet Cody has never taken a backward step as an MLA. She's stood up for her electorate. She's stood up for workers. She's stood up for Labor values. And it will always be in Beck's name that workers' rights are now identified in the Human Rights Act as workers' rights are human rights. And that Beck Cody brought forward that private members' bill and that will be on the ACT statute book and as a tribute to her. I'm not, you know, pre-empting anything, um, but given what Anthony is projecting, I, I really did want to make that comment. And Deepak only elected on count back last year and has worked incredibly hard for his electorate. If he also loses his seat, you know, that, that's devastating for him. It's a real loss for the Labor caucus. Steve yeah. has been an outstanding colleague. Now, you are entitled to make those acknowledgements as part of the quid pro quo for <laughs> our um, gratitude, really, in having you on our panel tonight, Rachel Stephen-Smith. Some busy days ahead. There's never much of a decompression period after <laughs> an election win. I'm going to thank you and farewell you at this point. Then turn to Vicky Dunn uh, to say thank you for tonight and congratulations for your service to the community over 19 years. Vicky, I can only begin to imagine Imagine how sad it is to rule a line under that tonight, yeah. but congratulations on all you've achieved and thanks for being part of our coverage. Thanks. Uh, look, it, it is sad and it is sad to see your colleagues who've worked so hard um, and to see the disappointment that we haven't done what we set out to do. And I'm very sad to see that we might be losing some extraordinary members in, you know, possibly possibly James Milligan, possibly Andrew Wall. I'm, I'm devastated yep. by that. But um, parties renew and... Parties renew rebuild. and and they're both young men who have great futures yep. and uh, and will be able to turn their hand to, to many other things. Uh, and But it, it is still... It's, it's, it's one of the things that I always want to avoid, which is why I left on my own terms, mm -hmm. to be in that... Because that's the thing, and Hare Clark is so hard. Mm. You never know when, you know, one of your own or somebody else is going to come and, and, and chop you off at the knees. Uh, and it is more likely to happen in Hare Clark than anywhere else. All right. Well, you're walking away with knees intact. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoy the remainder yeah, of, arthritic, of yes. your Saturday night, <laughs> Vicky Dunn. And finally, to my colleague, Adam Shirley, presenter of ABC Radio Canberra's mornings program. Adam, the adventure begins for you after you get to decompress a little. Uh, plenty to pull apart here throughout next week uh, as you get this new government to come and talk to you about where next. Can, mm. Going to be a bit to do. There will be. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Rachel and Vicky and all the members of the Assembly for being so open and available to speak with the Canberra public via ABC Canberra, an evening like this. One thing I, I find a, a real treasure and, and to, I guess, hold very dear to our hearts is the openness, the accountability in the ACT with a degree of professional civility as well. You referenced the US earlier, I think, Greg. To compare and contrast is, is very difficult to do, but what I do think is this jurisdiction is evidenced by tonight's panel, it's evidenced by how vigorously people prosecute issues, not personal pe personalities and, and have, uh, are into personal attacks as so much. I think there's a real strength in the way that our dem democracy works in the ACT, which is undersold nationally, if I'm honest. I don't think it's given the credit it's due. When you see people like Vicky, who served for nearly 20 years, Rachel Stephen-Smith, and others across the political spectrum here, there is a healthy respect and yet a vigorous debate, epitomised in our leaders' speeches tonight. And I think that's something that Canberrans, ACT residents, can be very proud of. 
it's a real privilege to be a small part of it and to be to be working with yourself tonight too. No, really and thank you. you for your role in communicating daily. Uh, what is a really important democracy, Adam Shirley, you'll be hearing a lot more from him and we thank him so much for his insights, which means we're getting to this final phase where Anthony Green and I will be able to step through what we call in the business the call of the board. We're going to go through each one of the five electorates just to, uh, just, ju just to check the final vote count which I think, Anthony, uh, sits up near 80% at uh, the close of business for us tonight. Yeah, well, we'll do the, uh, the overall votes for the election. We've got 78.4% counted. Now, to come are the postal votes. Uh, they've not been counted. Also, the paper pre-poll votes, which was about 9 to 10% of all pre-polls were cast as paper. So there are, uh, in terms of, there are some votes that postals tend to favour the Liberal Party, and you'd think the paper... Uh, pre-polls would favour the traditional parties. I think younger voters are much more likely to use electronic voting. So we'll see. They're, they're the votes to come. But the overall totals are the Labor Party's on 38.4%, Liberals 33, Greens 13.9, others 14.7. If you look at the change in votes occurred, the Labor vote is static, Liberals down 3.6, the Greens up 3.6 and others are on, on 0.1. The oddity is that Labor's mm -hmm. vote is well up in Brindabella and well down in Yerribee for mm -hmm. the Liberal vote reverse. So there's been a bit of a reverse on what's been seen as a north-south divide in Canberra at this election. And just, uh, we'll do a quick run through the chamber. <clears throat> uh, we've given away 22 of the 25 seats. What we're saying is we have Labor with a definite 11, uh, the Greens with three, and the Liberals are eight. That's 22 seats. The seats we have in doubt are the last seat in Brindabella. It's unclear whether it's Labor or the Greens. The last seat in Ginandera, we're not sure whether it's the Liberals or the Greens. And outside, I think Labor's pretty sure, certain of three, but it's between Liberals and Greens in Ginandera. And in Carajon, it's between the uh, Liberal, second Liberal and the second Green. Mm. So there's still a chance of getting two Greens in Carajon, which is why I say the Greens are somewhere between three and six. If they, they've got a definite three, they could yet win one extra in the two other seats and a second in Carajon. So it's, it could yet be 11-6. Yeah, we'll, eight, we'll pick that 12, up. Or 12, 5 and 8, yeah. Yeah, we'll pick that up as we go through the individual yeah. seats. But uh, I suppose only a little needs to go right for that Greens number to climb yeah. substantially, you're suggesting. Yeah, and for the moment, I'll just do the party totals rather than go through all the candidates sure. each time. But um, in, in Brindabella, it's 2.46 quotas for Labor, 2.28 for the Liberals, and the Greens are on 0.66. Uh, now, the, the difficulty there is the third Labor candidate and the and the Green are neck and neck in the current distribution of preferences. Elected members are Mick Gentleman and Joy Birch from the Labor Party, Mark Parton and Nicole Lauder from the, from the Liberal Party. We have Andrew Wall defeated in Brindabella and we're not sure whether it's Tamus Werner Gibbings or Jonathan Davis for the last seat. OK. Uh, so I think the next one we should visit, Anthony, is uh, probably up to Gin and Dera yeah. next. And Labor's got 2.44 quotas. The Liberals 1.55, the Greens 0.77, and the Bokor Party with 0.55, and there have been quite a lot of exhausted preferences in that lot. Um, the elected members, we are, are pretty confident that Gordon Ramsay, Tara Shane, and Yvette Berry are elected. Elizabeth Kickett is elected. Um, we have one defeated, and we have no defeated members. We're not sure it's Joe Clay. I'm not even sure who the second Liberal on that ticket is. It's, uh, um, let me have a look here. Probably Robert Gumming. Mm. Uh, Peter Kane Peter ahead Kane. of Robert Gunning. So the, but the point mm. is, they're very low on the ticket. Yeah. And Elizabeth Kickett needs so many preferences to get there. Um, there isn't... And even the Green vote is split, but the exhaustion of the, um, the competition from the Belco party has really hurt the Liberals in, Bel in, in Gin and Dera. OK, and then we'll go just a further... Uh, well, over to the east, really, and Currajong. Anthony? Um, Labor's got 2.31, Liberals 1.57 and the Greens 1.44. We think the Greens will get two seats there and the simple reason is there are a number of parties whose preferences flow to the Greens and Labor's got a 0.3 surplus and that will flow to the Greens and that gets them there. Um, just, to, just to point out that Andrew Barr's got 1.3 quotas and Alex uh, Rachel Stephen-Smith. It's this split here in the middle and Shane Rattenbury in the second Green going doing well. The elected members, Andrew Barr, Rachel Stephen-Smith, Elizabeth Lee, Shane Rattenbury. Uh, I have no defeated members. 
and I think Rebecca Vassarotti is a, is a chance of the best chance of winning that last seat. I didn't get the name of the second Liberal there, Candace, Candace Birch, Birch, of course. Yes. She may be defeated. So that's another potential defeated member there. So the Greens still there or thereabouts, perhaps, on <laughs> those numbers. And the seat that we began the evening, Anthony, by talking a lot about, Murrumbidgee. Yeah, well, the chance of the Liberals winning that one just disappeared, uh, basically. Labor 2.21 quotas, their vote was up. They had two sitting members this time. They had none last time. Uh, Jeremy Hansen wasn't leader this time. Plus, there was, you know, the, there was more competition from other sitting members this time. The Greens have got 0.73. We're saying the elected members are Marisa Patterson is elected a new Labor member. Chris Steele's been re-elected. Julia Jones, Jeremy Hansen re-elected. Emma Davidson should be the new member. And we've got one defeated there. Beck Cody has been defeated for the Labor Party. Yep, that then leaves us only Yerribee up around Gungarland to round out the night. And the party titles there are the Canberra was on 2.41, Labor on 2.08 and the Greens 0.62. Uh, the difficulty is the Liberals isn't turning into three seats. It's just a little bit low. Um, there's some other parties there. With, with the distribution of preferences doesn't look like it's going to elect a third Liberal. So I was saying, we're saying Susan Orr is elected, Michael Pettersson is elected, Leanne Castley is a new Liberal member, Alistair Coe is re-elected, Andrew Braddock is elected. And if you look at the defeated members, is James Milligan has been defeated. And I haven't... Deepak, Reach, Deepak Raj Gupta should be there as a defeated mm. member as well. I haven't marked him as mm. defeated, but, yeah, that's... Uh, that's uh, a change or loss of a Labor seat there, likely to go to the Greens, but also a change of membership on the Liberal side. All right, well, that is a wrap. Anthony Green, no election night is complete without your analysis. There aren't many people who can mentally distribute five <laughs> Excel spreadsheets of preferences, then stand in front of a touch screen to tell us about that. You've done it tonight in an accurate and timely way. We thank you, along with those who support you in your small team, including a fellow well-known to ABC viewers now in Casey Briggs, who has been assisting Anthony here in Canberra, and Ryan Curlin, who drives those impressive graphics on the screen that Anthony's pointing at and poking at, sometimes in frustration, I might be saying, <laughs> all night long. Anthony, you've got a bit of business ahead of you. Uh, AC, uh, sorry, Queensland and USA. Uh, yeah, Queensland's a lot more work. The uh, American election actually doesn't involve me a lot of work. Leave that to Casey. <laughs> I just present. That's, OK, that's a Casey Briggs project, I'm saying. Now, that's where we'll wrap up, wrap up our coverage of ACT Votes 2020, a night when Canberrans have decided to entrust the Labor government to govern their city through to 2023. Count them. There's a little more counting to come, of course, and what isn't precisely clear is whether Labor gets to do all this in its own right, but some involvement by the Greens will get them across the line in any event. From here comes all the hard work for the Bar government to rebuild a pandemic-struck economy and to guide growth through the recovery. So, thanks to all who've joined our coverage, enjoyed it perhaps, watched it and participated in it too. There are a few higher profile elections coming up in the next few weeks. We just canvassed some of those with Anthony, but none is contested as keenly as an ACT poll when it comes to those truly local issues that bring it all back home for voters. Keep in touch with ongoing reporting by the local ABC News team. From us at the National Museum of Australia, that's it for now. Have a great night.